Chapter 81 Acknowledgement You are listening at NovelFull.Audio Take me to where my oldest brother is. What? I don't know how to ride a cockatoo, so I'm asking you to take me with you. Dayanin shook his head at Kyle's request. There's no way I'll do that. I can't take care of you when we have no time to lose. Think about it, Dayanin. I'm not just speaking nonsense. Kyle looked up at Dayanin with pleading eyes. Is he saying that he can threaten me since I was the one who let Prince Vasin go while Night Sky is targeting Prince Vasin? And so I should just listen to him. Dayanin furrowed his eyebrows. No, that's not it. Dayanin eventually took a deep breath and said, All right. So what do you think the reason is? asked Kyle. If Night Sky really is targeting the first prince, it'll be to make someone else crown prince. Miracles from Night Sky had been rare recently. However, it was clear that the power of Night Sky was involved in matters of Black Scale's royal family. If I'm not mistaken, perhaps Night Sky thinks that you should be the crown prince instead of the first prince. Oh, it seems that you also think so. Dayanin was caught off guard, but Kyle quickly continued. Anyways, no matter how well Night Sky lures Manon, it would be difficult to hurt my brother if I stick close. Manon isn't accurate with his front feet and snout. Night Sky may lose both my brother and me if he isn't careful. Yes, I agree. Dayanin wondered if it was okay to go against Night Sky's will, but decided that it wasn't the time to dwell on it. No, Night Sky may be pleased since there's a prince that reads God's will so well. Besides, this wouldn't be the only chance to make someone else crown prince, would it? God wouldn't blame people for trying to survive. Dayanin then said, I'll quickly go to the hunting department and bring a cockatoo. I'll wait here. We should be able to catch up with Vaisen, he left not long ago. Dayanin hoped that was true. Your Highness, it is likely this way. Likely. Then I might as well chase after him with my eyes closed. The first prince, Vaisen, smirked. Manon was twenty-five meters long, but the trees in the mountains were much taller than the height of Manon's shoulders. Although it was a family's burial site, the mountain ranges were connected and reached all the way to the center of the continent, beyond automation. If Manon stayed still deep in the mountains, it would be difficult to find him. However, Manon went around making a mess everywhere and left behind obvious traces, which made one wonder where he had been hiding all this energy until now. One would have to be blind to not know he had been to a place with all the broken trees and the marks that his tail left in the ground. Vaisen could understand Manon. It's obvious why he would have so much energy, he's lived in a garden for more than a hundred years. Your body must have been so stiff, buddy. The garden Manon lived in was very large, but it was pretty clear that it was too cramped for Manon since he could get from one side to another with only a few steps. It's commendable that he held it in until now. Crack. Birds flew up at the sound of something breaking, which was followed by a thundering thud of something hitting the ground. Thump. As Vaisen looked up at the sky, a cloud of dust rose in the air. I guess we're almost there. It seems he hasn't gotten as far as I thought. Just as Vaisen predicted, he soon spotted Manon, and he went up the hill to get a good look at the drake. Manon seemed to be sleeping curled up. He glanced at the tree that he had broken with his tail while sleeping, made a big yawn, and fell back asleep. Ha, huh, I underestimated his beastly nature. It does seem like he has the spirit of the Thunder Dragon King. Other than Vaisen, however, the people in his hunting party gulped and became nervous just from looking at Manon from afar. They had followed Vaisen out of curiosity, as they were tipsy, but they soon understood the reality when they saw Manon's gigantic form. So, what do we do now, Prince? Shouldn't we wake him up and drive him back to the palace? His hunting friend's faces stiffened. Since they were children of prestigious families, there was a quick dot witted one among them. I have another idea. What is it? It seems that he fell asleep because he was exhausted from excitedly running around, but I don't think he noticed the animals he could hunt on the way. 
So what do you say we catch a deer or a wild boar to lure him? Hm, that seems like a good idea. Vason turned to his hunting friends and said, I should keep watch in case Manon wakes up and goes somewhere else. You guys go catch something that would be appetizing for Manon. Even those who usually wouldn't have liked doing errands were pleased with Vason's words, and they went down the hill riding their cockatoos. Looking at their backs, Vason snorted. Talk about faces full of fear. I'll consider it fortunate if they don't run away making excuses. They'll probably just wait around until the hunting department or palace guards get here. Vason didn't expect much from his hunting friends anyway. It would be more difficult for me to get properly acknowledged if I bring back Manon with the help of others. Vason briefly thought about acknowledgement. When Vason was younger, he hadn't paid much attention to being acknowledged. His mother and father left ministers, and the ministers who studied a lot all used to compliment him whenever he achieved something. However, he wasn't exactly the sharpest tool in the shed, and after his younger brothers were born, he realized that he got praised only because of the bloodline he was born into. In particular, the existence of his third brother showed Vaisen what real acknowledgement looked like in comparison to meaningless compliments. When people really acknowledge something, they don't make a fuss, openly admire it, or let out an exclamation. And they don't say nice things. That's not what real acknowledgement is like. Vaisen had come to this realization as he was taking lessons from Ravlin with his brothers. After they all read Siran Mule's theology book Night Sky together, Ravlin asked the prince's questions and expected answers. At the time, his third brother Kyle said after silently staring down at the book, Teacher Ravlin, is night sky good. Natured. What? And is night sky also almighty? Yes, that is so. Your Highness, is there a problem? I just have a simple question, Kyle said. If night sky truly is almighty and good. Natured at the same time, why do they let war, suffering, sadness, and unhappiness be? Oh, well. That's, Ravlin hesitated. And even Vaisen understood what that hesitation meant. Ravwin didn't know the answer either. Ravwin then honestly replied, Prince Kyle, I'm sorry. I'm not a priest of night sky and thus do not know much about theology. I will bring you the answer next time. That day, Ravwin had the princes read on their own while he looked out of the window with a troubled expression. The lesson ended early that day. That was what real acknowledgement looked like. But the more painful fact was that, in that case, Vaisen had never received real acknowledgement so far. Therefore, Vaisen lost interest in studying and began to take part in dangerous and reckless acts. When Vaisen did something crazy despite his status as the crown prince, people did show their real emotions from time to time instead of giving him empty compliments. It wasn't acknowledgement, but it was at least real. I know it's not right. But, People of the palace said that Vaisen was not clever, but that was not entirely true. Vaisen had the quality of a hunter, which was a keen sense. So he was able to catch the eyes of those who gave him subtle looks of criticism better than anyone else. Criticism that he wasn't worthy of being crown prince, and that he wouldn't be the kind of king who did great things. What am I supposed to do when I was born this way? Vaisen did act mean toward those who looked at him with such gazes but he didn't hate them. The ones he truly hated were the others. The ones who said he deserved to be crown prince since he was the first child and gave him false acknowledgement for their own benefit. If he became king, he was going to distinguish them from those who truly meant well and give official recognition to the latter for their distinguished service. Whenever he looked in the mirror, however, he was reminded that he wasn't worthy of being crown prince and that he wouldn't be the kind of king who did great things. He looked at himself with the same kind of gaze as well. I'm not confident. But that's fine. Vaisen intended to bring back Manon by himself. Since anyone would throw a fit when they were woken up, he planned to wake Manon up and lure him back to the palace. Although Manon was big, Vaisen's cockatoo was especially fast, and Vaisen was confident in handling cockatoos. And if that wasn't enough, he believed in night sky. 
let's see if I'm the one to really become king. Vaisen pulled at the reins to urge his cockatoo to approach Manon. Vaisen's cockatoo looked back at Vaisen as if it were asking if that was really the way he intended for it to go, but as Vaisen slightly kicked its side, it went down the hill in resignation. Vaisen. Until he heard Kyle's voice. Vaisen, stop. Kyle immediately jumped off Danan's cockatoo when it stopped. However, it seemed that he had landed wrong, and he crouched down, grabbing his ankle immediately. Oh, darn. Prince Kyle. Are you okay? Kyle. I'm okay. I must have sprained my ankle. Vaisen looked back and forth between Manon and Kyle. With a sigh, he got off his cockatoo and ran to Kyle. Vaisen said to Dayanin, hunting minister, why have you brought him here? Oh, well, whatever. Do you know there's a mountain ranger's hut over there on the mountain ridge? Yes, I know about it. I'll be right back. The hut was always filled with supplies needed for people traveling to and from the mountain, and among the supplies was medicine to reduce swelling, as well as clean fabric to put on or wrap around injury. Vaisen frequented the mountains because he liked to hunt, and Dayanin was the hunting minister, there was no way he wouldn't know about the hut. Let's see, little man. You should have been more careful. Kyle held his ankle and laughed when he saw Dayanin riding up to the hut with his cockatoo. I'm okay, Vaisen. Ha! Huh. I didn't sprain my ankle. I acted like I did because I didn't want Dayanin to hear our conversation. What? Vaisen squinted at Kyle, and Kyle lightly jumped on both of his feet to show that he was okay. Our conversation. Before that, why have you come up here? It's not like you didn't know it was dangerous with Manon close by. I came because of that. Explain. Kyle explained the signs of sabotage he had told Dayanin about. He explained that parts of the wooden bars had been chewed through by bugs, and that if not for the bugs, the collapse of the wooden fence would have made a lot of noise when Manon escaped. Someone had done it on purpose, but it would take a miracle for the deed to be done unnoticed. Thus, it was the will of night sky to lure Manon to the mountains. After Vaisen heard all that, he hesitated. Dot so are you saying that night sky is trying to kill me? I'm saying that things could be interpreted that way. At least Dayanin seems to think I'm right. And that's why you think you should stay next to me. Yes. That way you would be safe. Vaisen felt bitter but also proud of his brother at the same time. Kyle was a brother that one could not help but acknowledge. However, if that's what you think, why did you do such a thing? What? If what you said is true, you would have become king if you didn't do anything. The first prince would have died, the second prince has become a priest of the night sky, so you would naturally become the crown prince in that case. Little man, do you not want to become king? Kyle shyly smiled and said, I do want to become king. Yes. Others won't blame you even if you have that desire. It's a valid wish. So why have you come here? Kyle turned to Manon, who was sleeping below. BDNVL.M, do you know? Know what? If you look at the old books, Night Sky does not fail. They succeed in anything they wish for. Well, that's, it's not because they are a god. Look at the gods of the other countries. They are busy deceiving others with clever words and covering up their defeat. And that's especially clear with Shaven the Demon Queen. What is it you're trying to say? Seeing that there are gods who fail in their plans, I think Night Sky could also do the same. However, Night Sky would be more prepared. Using Manon to target you is just one of the methods out of many. Vaisen's eyes widened. Kyle continued. Other than that, they could also arrange a situation for only us two to be present, like now. When I grabbed my ankle and acted, you hurriedly ran over to me. Even though I'm young, if I had prepared a sword coated with poison, you would have been defeated right on the spot. And would Night Sky only have two scenarios planned? There is no success in catching Manon. 
It's already gotten to the point that the palace guards who should be guarding the palace have been mobilized to catch Manon, and the price needs to be paid. Those who are sacrificed in the process of catching Manon could become your price to pay, which would be another way for your position as crown prince to be abolished. This is as far as I've gotten, and more chances would likely come. However, I plan to tell you every time I identify a chance. Vason then said with a trembling voice, that you're going to go against all three of the chances that Night Sky will give you. Yes. I will do so. Why? Even if you leave aside your desire to become king, are you not afraid of Night Sky? Kyle looked at Vason with his black eyes. Yes. I know of Night Sky's will, so I am not afraid. The paths that Night Sky has laid for me to become king all go against my will and will hurt you. Therefore, I'm abandoning those paths to find a better way to protect you, while also pleasing Night Sky. And what is that? Go against all of Night Sky's plans and dare to ask this of you. Say it. Vason, give me the seed of Crown Prince. Dot. Vason began to laugh. He grabbed his stomach and sat on the ground laughing. As if he found Vason's reaction unexpected, Kyle reluctantly asked, Vason. Oh, sorry. It's just so funny. What's so funny? Vason shook his head and didn't answer. It wasn't that he had nothing to say. I'm just glad that you're wiser than anyone else and never give up on finding the right way. That's why I laughed. However, in order to keep his reputation as an older brother, Vason didn't tell Kyle that. Vason wiped away the tears he had shed from laughing. Little Ma, no, Kyle. Yes. I will do as you said. Vason thought that the brother he acknowledged would be a worthy crown prince. Chapter 82 A bigger meaning you are listening at novel full audio. But Kyle, you know that I can't give up the seed of Crown Prince just because I want to, right? Now that I've decided to do it, of course I'll help you, but, yes. I'll get ready. Silently, Vason admired the fact that he was able to put weight on the words of a twelve-year-old child. But what do we do about that? Kyle's gaze trailed to where Vason was pointing at. Oh, Manon. Kyle had solved the problem that had been on his mind for a while, but not the problem in front of him. Bringing Manon back to the palace wasn't an easy thing to do. Kyle was looking down at Manon when he saw Dayanin riding his cockatoo toward them. Usually, the person in charge would have to take care of it, but, but. Leaving him there might be a solution itself. Vason stroked his chin. Manon was a giant monster. The range of a drake's activity was not small, so it would be a big problem if they just left him there and allowed him to go to roads or private houses where there were people. At first glance, the idea was absurd, but it seemed somewhat reasonable when Kyle was the one proposing it. How? I'll explain when the hunting minister gets here. Kyle got on the cockatoo with Vason, and they went down the mountain together with Dayanin. As they were going down, Kyle talked about what to do with Manon. Dayanin was reluctant at first, but then his expression turned thoughtful, and he eventually nodded. As they got to the wooden bars where Manon had escaped through, Dayanin said, All right. Let's do as Prince Kyle said. It's also an offer that I have no reason to refuse. I look forward to your cooperation, hunting minister. After saying so, Kyle and Vason disappeared into the palace. Dayanin looked at Kyle in wonder. The hunting department was loosely connected to the royal family since the department prepared banquets and hunting, but there was no need for Kyle, who liked to read books and talk with other scholars, to care for the hunting minister. Perhaps. Maybe, at Orazen, Eldar said to Sung, Woon from on top of the palace's roof, Nebula, would this be okay? Why do you ask? It's good that the third prince is smart and doesn't go against God's will and he also seems to have an innocent side to him. But, Sung Wu nodded. He can interpret the revelations I give as he pleases, right? Aren't you worried? Sung Wu answered, not really. Why not? When playing the Lost World, 
I thought the game characters were the problem since they didn't move as I intended for them to. But I still played well. Yes. Just as Kyle had deduced, Sung Woon hadn't put all his hopes on his first plan, which he wasn't sure would work or not. He had a second plan and a third. Sung Dut Woon's goal was to make Kyle king by whatever means necessary, and in addition to Kyle's ability to deduce Sung Dut Woon's wishes one by one, Kyle's honesty in revealing his own wishes to Vaison turned into a catalyst for Vaison to give up his seat as the crown prince. But now I know they are people. Even if their will does not align with mine, it doesn't matter as long as they end up giving me the result I want. There's no need to dwell on it. And overall, overall. The situation is better, isn't it? Kyle would, of course, be a better king, but Vaison was a valuable asset that would be a waste to give up. Without Kyle, Sung Woon wouldn't have thought that there was any problem in Vaison becoming king. However, there can't be two kings. Eldar nodded. But are you not worried? It was fortunate that your will has aligned somewhat with Kyle's until now, but, Eldar. What? Sung Woon leaned over. Looking to the side, Eldar flinched when Sung Woon flicked their forehead. Ow. Eldar knew that Nebula hadn't simply done that to inflict pain, but rather intended it to be a wake.up call. Why? Sung, Woon raised himself back up and said, I didn't simply decide on Kyle for no reason. Intelligence was only one factor. Sung, Woon was there when Kyle Lak or Zen was born, he listened to the conversations that Kyle had with the scholars, and he also knew what Kyle had written down. Kyle respected and valued the heroes of the previous generations, and at the same time constantly explored whether there were better ways to do things. Even if one day Kyle ruined Sung Dot Woon's plan, that in itself could become more meaningful. Just like Lockrack did. King of Serenity was absent from the evening meeting. There was word going around among the ministers that his disease had returned, but the King of Serenity's symptoms had started when he was younger, so it wasn't anything new to the ministers. The administration minister, Seleucin O, oh, presided over the meeting. The first topic was, of course, Manon. The ministers attending the meeting had all been at the palace since the morning, so it was obvious that Manon's escape would be the topic of the day. However, I haven't heard anything about Manon being caught yet, hunting minister. At those words, the commander of the palace guards replied faster than Dayanin, yes, our palace guards are still waiting. Oh, you weren't able to catch him before the sun set and you can't go find him until it's daytime again. What are you going to do if Manon hurts people before you find him, hunting minister? Dayanin slightly nodded and said, Fortunately, I have found where Manon is. The finance minister, who was always strict toward Dayanin, spoke up. Isn't that obvious? Not being able to find a big thing like Manon, Dayanin interjected, Prince Vaison helped me. That is possible, but it's good that the prince helped. Yes. We've been watching him since then, but perhaps because he had been moving around all morning, he is now quietly sleeping. There shouldn't be a problem. Then the administration minister said, that is a relief, but, his majesty is very worried, and we can't mobilize our palace guards until tomorrow morning. You should have come to get the palace guards when you found Manon and brought him back to the palace at once. Dayanin nodded. I was going to do that at first, but then I discovered something suspicious when I investigated the process of Manon's escape. I decided not to bring Manon back for now. The ministers at the meeting were all surprised. Then we, Mun, the white-haired leader of the left ministers asked, does that mean you not only had no intentions of bringing Manon back today, but also plan not to bring him back in the future either? Yes. What excuse do you have to shirk the duty that His Majesty has given you? Dayanin walked forward, as if talking while standing still wasn't enough to make his point. I'm sure you are all surprised that I'm saying something different from what I proposed in the morning meeting. However, there is a reason, so I hope you'll hear me out. The finance minister was about to say something, but the administration minister shook their hand. All right, hunting minister. Let's hear it. 
Dayanin said, This morning, I went to Manon's garden in order to chase after him, but when I looked at the broken wooden bars, I discovered that bugs had eaten it. The finance minister rebuked, You're not trying to say that someone deliberately had bugs chew through the wood to play a trick on you, right? And even without the bugs, Manon still would have been able to break through the wooden bars without any trouble. Yes, of course that's not what I'm saying. I had the same thought as you. But. Dayanin smiled. But Prince Kyle seemed to think differently. He said that due to the parts the bugs had chewed on, the wooden bars easily broke, and the stone pillars connected to the wooden bars didn't fall, which was why there wasn't any noise last night, and the palace guard's discovery was delayed. However, like you said, it isn't possible for someone to have done it on purpose, and even if they did, they would have quickly been caught by the palace guards and gotten punished. So isn't it a coincidence then? No. If it's done on purpose, but not by a person, who would be able to do such a thing? Some looked at Dayanin with curiosity, while others looked at him with eyes widened in wonder. The administration minister then said, Are you suggesting it's, yes. It was done by night sky. But you're not the one to decide whether it's a miracle or not. Exactly. So I went to the religious order this afternoon and exchanged opinions with the priests. I'm not sure if you all know, but night sky used to be called blue insect god in the past, and even before that, they were called nameless beetle god. That means many of their miracles are carried out by insects. And the priests visited the scene to check the wooden bars the bugs had chewed on. Then, Dayanin's speech was interrupted when the door to the great hall opened and someone came in. It was a priest of the night sky religion dressed in a robe, and as soon as everyone saw the priest, they all quickly bowed. Yes, I have checked it myself. It is a miracle from night sky. At the priest's words, the administration minister asked, What brings you here, Prince Shun? Shun Lak Orazen, the king of Serenity's second son, said, The hunting minister said it would be better for a priest to come share the finding, so I did. You didn't have to do this yourself, your highness, now that I am a priest of night sky, you don't need to address me as a prince. And I heard that both my brothers helped find Manon, so I couldn't just stay out of it. Shun had joined the night sky religious order and became a priest. Dayanin bowed to Shun in gratitude before turning around. Therefore, it is all the will of night sky that Manon went out. I couldn't possibly go against the will of night sky and bring back Manon. No one could express discontent. It was the will of the King of Serenity to bring Manon back. However, sending Manon out was the will of night sky, and the gods will have been the main source of the royal family's authority. The administration minister then said, All right, Dayanin. If this is the will of night sky, it should not be disobeyed. However, I do wonder if it's okay to leave Manon as is. The priests of night sky should be the ones to decipher night sky's will, but until then, shouldn't we look out for the safety of our people? The other ministers nodded in agreement. Then Dayanin said, so I wish to expand and restructure the hunting department. The other ministers murmured among themselves. What do you mean? If Manon stays there as is, he can be a threat to the safety of many hunters, snake hunters, and peddlers. Therefore, we need to supervise the area so that no one would get near Manon, and in order to do that, we need a lot more people assigned to the hunting department. It was a very valid statement. However, the palace was a place where everyone kept each other's authority in check. Expanding the number of people in a group meant that a new force would be created. With those concerns in mind, the administration minister said, Well, hunting minister, I know it's an urgent issue. Just as many ministers have pointed out, Manon is a beast, and we can't predict where he'll go. Furthermore, if you think about his size, this matter really shouldn't be taken lightly. I would like to borrow the palace guards to do the job, but I cannot have the palace guards keep watch on Manon when they should be protecting the palace and his majesty. That's true. Let's think realistically. Manon is a beast, so from where would you make up for that manpower? 
There are many hunters in the private district that are good at navigating the mountains. We should hire them to track Manon, and also hire others to stop people from approaching Manon, would more manpower be enough? What? Of course not. If we don't want Manon wandering somewhere else, we need to feed him as we have done until now. We will need a wagon to move cows into the mountain. And since wagons break easily on mountainous paths, extra funds will be needed. And, as Dayanin listed everything that would be needed, the faces of the ministers, especially the finance minister, crumpled in dissatisfaction. They all wanted to deny and counter Dayanin's arguments, but it was going to be troublesome if they did that and Manon later caused an issue. If that happened, Dayanin, the hunting minister, would bring up those who opposed the expansion and restructure of the hunting department. H.M., I understand the general idea. Then how about you organize everything into a document by tomorrow morning, and we and His Majesty will go over it. That's a good idea. Then, I do have a little headache. Let's move on to the next item on the agenda. Dayanin returned to his seat. Normally, Dayanin wouldn't have been so greedy even if he had such an opportunity. And while he wanted the third prince to become king, that opportunity wouldn't easily come. So instead, he would have looked out for himself and invested a long time making those in the palace turn to his side one by one. However, Dayanin had come to see Kyle's will through this matter. Prince Kyle intends to become king. If that was the case, things would be easier for him. Even though he would be seated in the very back in their meeting with the king, Dayanin thought it all depended on who was in that seat, and how he used the opportunity. If he was able to increase manpower and expand their finances, that would create power in itself, and he would be able to use the power to further his cause. And Dayanin thought to use that personal power openly. With that power, I will help Prince Kyle become king. Six months later, the king of Serenity had Vaisen Lak Orazen relinquish his title and made Kyle crown prince. And three years after that, the king died of his long-time chronic disease, and Kyle Lak Orazen became the eleventh king of Orazen. This happened when Kyle was at the tender age of fifteen. Chapter 83 The first meeting with the king you are listening at NovelFull.audio Once again, I congratulate you, your majesty. It was the first prince, Vaisen, who was speaking to Kyle. The two brothers were sitting alone inside the detached study. Embarrassed, Kyle said, you don't have to speak so formally when it's just the two of us. How can you say that? You're now the king of the country. No. You're the king of the best country on the continent. You're in a position to oversee the people, so you should be treated accordingly. I know that, but, Kyle knew there was no use protesting, so he didn't insist any further. And Vaisen smiled as if he was satisfied. So, tomorrow is your first official meeting. Yes. I'm a little worried. There are things you worry about too. Kyle scratched his nose. Of course there are things that worry me. I actually think I have more worries than everyone else. Hmm, even though I've known you for many years, there were times where I couldn't figure out what you were thinking, but I think I know what one of your concerns is this time. And I think I might be able to help address that concern. Kyle replied, what do you think my concern is? Vaisen calmly said, tomorrow, one of the ministers will likely suggest you kick Vaisen Lak Orazen out of the palace. Isn't that one of your concerns? Kyle slowly nodded. Vaisen was right. If another prince was inside the palace, the royal authority could be shaken since those who were plotting a rebellion would want a prince for legitimacy. The second prince, Shunlak Orazen, was already a priest of night sky, so he posed no threat, but that wasn't the case for the first prince, Vaisen Lak Orazen. The ministers would ask for Vaisen to be driven out of the palace. Kyle lightly tapped the platform with his finger. But that's only an excuse. All the ministers knew that Vaisen had no intentions of plotting a rebellion, but the excuse that Vaisen could be tricked by others' schemes was enough to justify having him kicked out. Whether Vaisen really planned for rebellion or not was not the important part. 
the ministers would insist on doing so to prove that the king could not do everything as he wished. Currently, Black Scale is a country where the ministers hold great authority. Kyle didn't think that was bad in itself. Because no matter how competent a king may be, he was but one lizard man. Even Lockrack, the progenitor, used to listen to the opinions of his tribesmen to make the best decisions when he was a tribal chief. And if a king got conceited about his position, it was inevitable that the country would fall. However, the ministers are all too biased. Because most of them are lizard men. Since they were lizard men, it was obvious they would implement policies friendly to the lizard men, and because many lizard men were aristocrats, it was also obvious that they would implement policies friendly to the aristocrats. Those with vested interests had the tendency to hold on to their power. The late King of Serenity thought it was a matter that couldn't be easily solved, so he simply moved on. However, Kyle believed differently. Still, if I raise the issue in the first meeting, the noblemen will become wary when they should be able to freely approach me. Kyle was confident that he could solve many problems, but he could not not be worried about this matter because his brother, Vason, was involved. Then Kyle said, you have correctly guessed my concern, but you haven't mentioned what to do about it. What do you think needs to be done? Vason replied, tell them to send me out of the palace. What? Do it if the ministers wish for it. But you're, I'll be fine. Vason looked at the view outside Kyle's study room. I'm rather afraid that my presence will hold your majesty back from achieving great work. I'm okay. I came here today to tell you this. It's rather a good thing. Even if I am to hunt, the biggest thing in the mountains is the wild boar, isn't it? Oh, excluding man and that is. Kyle pensively looked down at the table as if he was thinking about something. Hunting, hunting you say, dot hmm. Vason, could you help me a bit more since you already have been? Vason realized Kyle had come up with a good idea. Yes, of course. I don't think you'll dislike it too much either. After listening to Kyle's idea, Vason realized Kyle was right. The next day, at the official meeting. With Kyle sitting on the throne, all the ministers attended the early morning meeting. It was the first meeting since Kyle became king, so everyone stood with a nervous expression. Kyle was a 15-year-old boy. However, before he became king, he had already shown affinities in politics unbefitting of his age several times. So the ministers had no idea of how to treat this young king. Kyle spoke up first. We're all familiar with each other, but it's the first time we've gathered here like this. I'm aware there isn't any urgent matter at the moment, so I want you all to tell me anything I may need to know right now. The young lizardman's high dot pitched voice rang throughout the grand hall. And perhaps because of that, Seleucin O, oh, who had been the administration minister since the rule of the late King of Serenity, boldly spoke up. Your Majesty. Prince Vason cannot be left in the palace. The highest ranking official in black scale was the administration minister. And Seleucin O oh had been administration minister for decades. Kyle was aware that he represented all the other ministers. Seleucin continued to say, Prince Vason used to be crown prince. I know your majesty is close to him, but if Prince Vason remains in the palace, those who seek to plot a rebellion may try to sway him, all right. Dot and shake your royal authority, what? I just agreed to what you said, didn't I? Seleucin and all the other ministers exchanged looks with each other as if they hadn't expected Kyle to concede so easily. Thinking that Kyle acknowledged the authority that the ministers had just like the king before him, Seleucin continued to say, understood. Then I think Prince Vason should be sent out of the capital city, Orizen, and, I don't like that. Dot but if Prince Vason remains in Orizen, stop. Kyle lightly struck the armrest of the throne. How dare you assume what I'm thinking. I have pondered over the matter of my brother as much as you have. The ministers knew that Kyle's agreement to send Vason out of the palace was a big concession. And in return, the ministers would have to give up something. Seleucin nodded. What are your thoughts, your majesty? Before I tell you, 
there's something I want you all to know. Do you know there is an unexplored part of our country that no one has ventured into yet? Yes. Solusin bowed. You're talking about the eastern mountains, right? Yes. Many kings have sent people to explore it, but they quit because the terrains are too rough and steep. But why do you suddenly mention it? The mountain range stood east of Black Scales Wilderness. Attempts to explore the land stopped when a few ships got lucky enough to travel between the northern coast and Maganen, the end of the peninsula, and discovered that the land beyond the mountain wasn't very large. Although it was located within Black Scales territory, it was difficult to cross the mountain range. Since there wasn't much beyond it, the kings of the past believed the trouble far outweighed what little benefits it would bring and easily gave up on overcoming the terrains. Kyle got to his point and said, until now, the eastern mountain range had not been considered very important, but the five countries to our west, Danyum, Red Fruit, Goldeneye, Mangul, and Asbestos, are all threatening black scale. We cannot miss the opportunity to strengthen our country. Therefore, shouldn't we develop the eastern mountain range? Seleucin slightly raised his head. Are you saying that we should send Prince Vasin to the eastern mountain range? Yes. The big brother I know is a very talented hunter and a great warrior. He's also someone who even had the courage to look for Manon by himself. Seleucin secretly made eye contact with the other ministers. To the ministers, the eastern mountain range didn't have much value. Sending someone there would be the same as making them suffer. But His Majesty is young. Apparently he still likes Owen's travel journal. Does he think he's doing his brother good because of Vason's willingness to always go on an adventure? They would only know once they heard Vason out, but in Seleucin's perspective, the only type of hunting that Vason enjoyed was catching the prey in forest well. Maintained by the hunting department. And since Vason grew up in the royal family, rough work didn't suit him. Given the other ministers didn't seem to oppose the idea of sending Vason to a land of rough terrains, Seleucin nodded. Your Majesty's proposal seems like a good idea. So can we proceed with that? Yes. Then we should set up a convoy. Pardon. A convoy, meaning a group of ships. All those who had attempted to explore the eastern mountain range until now had been moving on land, so Seleucin did not expect a convoy to be brought up. Besides, one ship did not make a convoy. Kyle meant that he would give Vason several ships, which would take a great number of people to man. Given the ships were the country's properties, they would have to be guarded by soldiers as well. The idea was far from what Seleucin and the other ministers had in mind. In response to Seleucin's question, Kyle reprimanded, Why are you so surprised? Isn't the failure of exploring the eastern mountain range until now attributed to people trying to go over the mountain on land? Then it's obvious that we should go to the other side of the mountain on ships, is it not? B. But your majesty. I'm aware that there's no sea route beyond the eastern mountain. It would be better to go on land, then my brother is going to find a route, isn't he? For how long is Black Scale going to keep a plot of land untouched? With so many troops deployed, the danger of a rebellion will also, stop. We can just have someone keep my brother in check. You're acting like it's such a difficult matter. However, why are you going against what we agreed on after only the time for a cup of tea to be finished? Let's see. When exploring the land, they'll run into all sorts of animals, beasts, and monsters. Right, the hunting minister will be in charge. Dayanin replied as if he had been waiting for the order, understood. Seleucin glared at Dayanin and thought that he couldn't just back off like this, but Kyle was no easy opponent. I get what you're trying to say, finance minister, so let's have this conversation later. There is someone waiting in front of the Grand Hall. Seleucin already felt exhausted. Seleucin and the other ministers had thought that Kyle had nothing prepared, and that they could just pressure him somewhat. Kyle had been mild.mannered until now, so they assumed that he would react gently. But that was not the case. Kyle had made up his mind from day one. What do you mean? Come in. 
The doors of the grand hall opened, and in walked someone shorter but bullier than the average lizard men. In addition to hair, the newcomer also had a beard, which the lizard men called decorational hair. Underneath his smooth skin were muscles that couldn't be hidden by thick fat. Someone yelled, it's a dwarf. The ministers murmured among themselves. What can a thing like that do? What is the guard doing? Why aren't you driving that shorty away? Regardless of the words being thrown at him, the dwarf walked up to Kyle, bowed, and got on one knee. I have come as you ordered. Seleucin held in his sigh and looked back at Kyle. Your Majesty, what is this? He is rung from the technology department. It's only natural that none of you recognize him, since he was a slave until recently. What? This dwarf was a slave. No, your majesty. I wasn't asking about his name or status. I was asking why he's here. Kyle shrugged. Isn't the seat of technology minister empty right now? So I plan to have him assume the role. Outside of a few ministers, everyone else opened their mouths to talk to Kyle while splattering spit. Dot, what do you mean you're going to bring a dwarf into this sacred grand hall? Never. Your Majesty, I beg your kindness. Why a dwarf of all species? Dwarves are the fools that resisted until the end against the Thunder Dragon King when he was expanding black scale. Each of them talked over the other so much that Kyle's ears were starting to hurt, but a smile appeared on his face. As expected, none of them says another word about Vason. Chapter 84 Solar Eclipse Ceremony You are listening at NovelFull.audio However, Kyle also had no intentions on giving up making the dwarf the technology minister. The finance minister, Seleucin O, oh, said, until now, the position of technology minister had been first served by Zale, and then by numerous lizard men after her. Why is it that you're giving it to a dwarf, who used to be a slave? You're saying strange things, finance minister. Since when did one species matter when it comes to the position of technology minister? To me, it sounds like you're saying that the former technology ministers until now had received the honor because they were lizard men regardless of their talent. Was Zale that kind of person? Seleucin bowed. That's not what I was trying to say. Then do you agree that Zale and everyone else who served as technology minister were talented and knowledgeable in technology, regardless of their species? Yes, but they were also all, Saluison was about to talk about the tradition that lizard men had been the ones making up the government until now, but Kyle was quicker. Lizard men. I can't meet all the technology ministers there were until now, but the fact that they were all lizard men was because the lizard men were the most talented of their time, right? That simply isn't the case this time. Kyle had paid respect to all the kings of the previous generations, so it was difficult for Seleucin to push for his point. His competence is in question, your majesty. I've checked his competence myself. With all due respect, it is my understanding that a king needs to listen to all the other ministers' opinions when choosing the right minister. Kyle nodded and said, Finance minister, do you know about the altitude of Polaris? Yes, I do. Explain it to me. I am aware that it is the angle at which one looks up at the north star of the celestial sphere in relation to the horizon. And do you know what the altitude of Polaris in Orizen is? At those words, Seleucin O's expression turned embarrassed. The altitude of Polaris was determined by latitude, through which one could figure out the time of sunset and sunrise. Astronomy and arithmetics were basic knowledge for the aristocrats, so Seleucin also knew about the altitude of Polaris, but didn't remember the figure that Kyle had asked about. Among the other ministers, the astronomy minister spoke up. I know it. Answer. Orazin's altitude of Polaris is 32 degrees and a half. The other ministers were relieved. If the astronomy minister hadn't responded, the dwarf would have given an answer he had prepared beforehand. They thought that was all part of Kyle's plan, but it was only the start. Then do you know the altitude of Polaris in Maganen and Zarin? Pardon. 
I asked if you know the altitude of Polaris in Zarin, the elf city at the edge of the northern coast, and Maganen, the village in the far south. I, do not know. Is there anyone who knows? Even the astronomy minister, who was confident in arithmetics, couldn't answer this time. He didn't know how far away Zarin and Maganen were, and even if he did, he had only memorized the value of Orazin's altitude of Polaris rather than having calculated the answer, so it would be no use. Rumpf, who had been silent and had his head lowered until now, then said, I would like to answer. Go ahead. Zarin's altitude of Polaris is 37 degrees and a half, and Maganen's altitude of Polaris is 30 degrees. How is that so? The altitude of Polaris varies 1 degree every 250 li. So since you have to go north by 1250 li to Zarin from here, Zarin's altitude of Polaris would be 5 degrees higher, and Maganen is 625 li south from here, so 2.5 degrees would be subtracted. Kyle nodded. That's right. You have answered what the ministers here couldn't. At those words, the astronomy minister stepped forward. How are you satisfied with one question and answer when choosing a minister? It meant that he couldn't accept this. Kyle held back his smile and asked again, All right. There is a circular patty. If the diameter of this patty is 12 steps, what is the area of this patty? The Astronomy minister thought for a moment and answered, You get the area of a circle by multiplying the radius by itself and then by 3, so the size of the patty is 108. Rumpf, how much do you think it is? It'll be approximately 113. Two different figures. At Rumpf's answer, the astronomy minister laughed at him. That dwarf has miscalculated the ratio of circumference to diameter of the circle. No. Didn't you get 108 because the ratio was assumed to be 3, asked Rumpf. Dot then Kyle asked Rumpf, what do you think the ratio is? It is bigger than 3, but smaller than 4. You are right. At Kyle's words, the astronomy minister asked, But your majesty, according to Zale's algebra theories. It says 3. However, the recent arithmetic books that were imported from abroad show that the value is greater than 3 and less than 4, just as Rumpf said, and the reasoning is supported by a formula. It seems that you have been neglecting your arithmetic studies. Several questions followed, but because of the astronomy minister's outdated arithmetic knowledge, he either gave a slightly wrong answer or answered later than Rumpf. The astronomy minister thus had no choice but to back down. That I have underestimated the studies of a small country, your majesty. Then put in the effort and study more. You don't need to be embarrassed. As the mood in the grand hall grew heavy, Kyle cleared his throat. Ahem. So has this matter been settled? No, your majesty. The one who voiced his opposition was again Seleucin, the administration minister. I will admit that the dwarf is unusually knowledgeable, but didn't you say he used to be a slave? Kyle nodded. I found out that Rumpf's father was from Danyum, but his mother was a slave of Orazin's former technology minister. After his father passed away, Ramp's mother raised him alone, and due to his talents, the former technology minister sent him on small errands, thus giving him the chance to go in and out of the palace. And because of that, while he hasn't received formal education, the knowledge he has gained through observation is comparable to the technology department officials. How could I dismiss him just because he used to be a slave? Seleucin shook his head. It was a line he could never concede. The technology department was only slightly above the hunting department in terms of importance. They made miscellaneous tools or machines that the palace needed, so they were mostly craftsmen who weren't regarded highly. It was a seat that Seleucin and the other lizardmen aristocrats had no reason to not give up, but today was the first meeting for the young king, and Seleucin felt that this small concession would be pivotal in directing public opinion going forward. No, you must not. Because he has a low status. Yes, Seleucin said. It is not a simple argument that this dwarf has a low status. The reason your majesty is king is because your majesty has inherited the blood of the great thunder dragon king, 
and the reason why the ministers here today are in this place is because they are the descendants of the warriors who had fought alongside the great thunder dragon king. The same is true of the dwarf. Dwarves were Black Scale's enemies until the very end. And even after this country was built, they tried to plot a rebellion. This dwarf is the descendant of that kind of species. At Seleucin's words, the other ministers threw him glances of admiration. The logic was that everyone attending this meeting was here because of the blood they inherited, so if Kyle wanted to make the dwarf a minister, he would be going against the traditions of the royal family. Kyle thought differently about the matter, but as of now, rhetoric was important. Do you not know what love for the people means? In the past, the warrior Tatar fought ten trolls to save a halfling, and the thunder dragon king opened the gates to slaves. Since the dwarf has an unusual talent, why can't any exceptions be made? Things will spiral out of control with one exception. If more are allowed to become ministers even if they aren't lizard men, who will be by your majesty's side? Kyle thought to himself. Those who aren't lizard men. Kyle questioned whether lizard men were really good at their jobs and thought they should only be appointed if they were competent. Moreover, Seleucin's opinion could be quite rude to the left ministers who took care of the palace. However, it seemed that the matter had hit a nerve in all the aristocratic lizard men. They all bowed and shouted, Your Majesty, I beg your kindness. We beg your kindness. Kyle then said with a disapproving face, All right then. I'll have to think about this matter for a while. Well, I'm thinking of having Rumpf as a technology official first. Do you oppose that as well? As Kyle showed concession, the ministers exchanged their opinions by glancing at each other with their heads down. The technology department was an unimportant post in the first place, and it was filled with craftsmen, so promotion was rare. In the ministers' perspectives, the fact that Kyle had given up so easily made them think that Kyle hadn't actually intended to make the dwarf a minister, but to give him a good enough position. In the end, Seleucin made the final judgment. We do not oppose that, your majesty. The technology department is originally a place for craftsmen, so if he's as talented as the officials, you may appoint him as you wish. Then Rumpf, this is it for now. You may leave for today. Yes, your majesty. Then Kyle moved straight to the next agenda. The next topic is about the upcoming solar eclipse, during the meeting that day, the ministers did not take any of the topics lightly. Shunlak Orazen, the second son of the late king of Serenity, sat alone on the wide maru of the Temple of Night Sky. At times of worship, the place was filled with priests and believers of night sky coming from various places to pray, but in the middle of the night, it was normal for there to be no one. Usually, it was also time for Shun to be asleep, but Shun was currently plagued with a concern. How did something like this happen? The solar eclipse was approaching. That in itself wasn't surprising to those who knew it was coming. Shun also understood solar eclipse to be a phenomenon where the moon briefly covered the sun. And since they were major astronomical phenomena, they were recorded without fail, and based on those records, it was possible to calculate when and where a solar eclipse would take place. However, a solar eclipse was not something everyone understood since not everyone was equipped with such knowledge. Without any knowledge, a solar eclipse would be seen as a strange and terrifying occurrence that suddenly made everything go dark even in the middle of the day. It would be fortunate if it was simply taken as a strange phenomenon that way, but it was inevitable for some to overthink it. Either as an omen or revelation related to God, or as an ominous sign about the future. Especially for those who believe in night sky, it would seem like the established order is broken. Some could even use a solar eclipse to incite chaos in the country. And in order to prevent something like that from happening, the night sky religious order observed the astronomical phenomena and warned the people in advance. When the priests informed the people of what would happen and told them that it had nothing to do with night sky's will, it allowed everyone to maintain their peace of mind. Therefore, astronomical observations and forecasts from the order need to be accurate. If the astronomical observations made by the order were wrong, people's faith in night sky would weaken. 
So until now, members of the religious order had been holding the solar eclipse ceremony alongside the palace rather than making judgment solely based on their own knowledge. And due to the fact that Shun, who was young for a priest, had been a member of the royal family, he was tasked with hosting the solar eclipse ceremony, which was a type of ritual for predicting the solar eclipse. Given it was a joint effort between the palace and the night sky religious order, the order had decided that his background would be helpful. And it wasn't a difficult task either. The priest in charge of the solar eclipse ceremony would be presented with three predictions made by the calendar priests of the night sky order, the astronomical officials of the palace, and the king. And the priest had to choose the one they thought to be most correct and hold the solar eclipse ceremony then. In the past, the three predictions had always been the same. But why are they, different this time? The times put forward by the calendar priests of night sky and the astronomical officials were the same. However, the time that the king, Kyle Lak Orazen, had presented was four hours later than the other two predictions. One, Li is a traditional Chinese unit of distance and is standardized to be half a kilometer two. The number in the Ross was 675, but the math doesn't match. Chapter 85 the humiliation of pirates you are listening at novelfull.audio. Shunlak Orazen was facing a dilemma. Is Kyle wrong? That could be the case. Usually it was custom for the king to follow either the prediction made by the calendar priests or the astronomy department. And it was so because the kings until now hadn't had much time to pay much attention to astronomy. However, brilliant Kyle did the calculations himself, and because of that, he might have gotten an incorrect result. But even if he is wrong, there's no way he wouldn't have known it. Shun knew his younger brother well. It would be fair to say that he recognized Kyle's competency sooner than his older brother, Vason. And therefore, he joined the night sky religion as a priest at a younger age than others. And perhaps, though Shun thought it was unlikely, he had another possibility in mind. The calculations presented by the calendar priests and the astronomy department were the results agreed upon by numerous scholars. On the other hand, no matter how smart Kyle was, it would be unlikely for him to have come to the correct answer alone. But what if Kyle is the only one with the right answer? If the solar eclipse ceremony was held at an incorrect time, Shun would be punished, but he had already made up his mind. Since he was part of the royal family, he knew he could avoid punishment. Would that be an abuse of power? But what's wrong with that? Wouldn't I be getting punished for someone else's wrongdoing if the answers are incorrect? Shun decided to hold the solar eclipse ceremony at the time that Kyle had predicted. And that decision brought chaos to the palace. The day of the solar eclipse ceremony. It was two hours before the predicted time for solar eclipse made by the calendar priests and astronomy department, and six hours before Kyle's prediction. On one side of the palace, the ministers were having an urgent meeting. Astronomy minister, say it. Are you sure your calculation is correct? When the administration minister, Seleucin O, urged him for confirmation, the astronomy minister nodded. I checked several times with our officials. I am certain. When the rest of the ministers still looked dissatisfied, the astronomy minister added, I even compared them to the calculations made by the calendar priests. There's no way it's wrong. Are you sure? What? Seleucin glared at the astronomy minister, but his eyes seemed to be focused on someone far behind him instead. At the first meeting the other day, the dwarf turned out to be more knowledgeable than you. And his majesty was shrewd enough to tell the right and wrong answers. Yet you're still sure. That's, answer properly. Our bloodline may be at stake here. The astronomy minister hesitated several times and finally spoke as if he had made up his mind. I am correct. Seleucin read from his eyes the confidence of a scholar rather than a judgment made for political reasons. All right. Then we should hurry. Shunlak Orazen did not quite understand Kyle's intention, but Seleucin was different. Seleucin had come up with two possible explanations for Kyle presenting a different prediction from the calendar priests and astronomy department officials. 
and the chances of one of the theories being true was low. No matter how smart His Majesty is, he can't be the only one correct when all the scholars of this country are wrong. That left only one explanation that Seleucin could think of. It's, a kind of war of nerves. Political conflict between the king and his noblemen had been non-stop since Lokrak's death. And Seleucin thought that might have been the case with Lokrak as well. If someone like the Thunder Dragon King made the wrong prediction about the solar eclipse, his noblemen would think they were the ones making a mistake and prepare the solar eclipse ceremony at the time of the Thunder Dragon King's choice. Then it wouldn't simply be the king's fault if it turned out the ceremony was held at the wrong time. The solar eclipse ceremony was held at the night sky temple, but in addition to the astronomy minister, several other ministers were involved as well. A king wouldn't be blamed for their errors, but that wasn't the case for the ministers. The ministers could be punished for not properly preparing the solar eclipse ritual. However, His Majesty is not the Thunder Dragon King. Kyle was not as strong as Lokrak, nor had he made enough achievements to garner the same kind of respect. It was worth noting that he had become king over the eldest son, Vaisen Lak Orazen, but it happened not because Kyle was unusually outstanding, but because Vaisen wasn't worthy of being the crown prince. At least that was what Seleucin believed. You won't be able to punish us, your majesty. Seleucin, the astronomy minister, and several other ministers went to Kyle. They insisted that the solar eclipse ceremony be held four hours before the time that Kyle had calculated. Then Kyle said, that I get what you are trying to say. I guess I have no choice if that's what you insist. Is it not too late? Seleucin believed that Kyle had simply given up. Yes. The solar eclipse ceremony had been in preparation since the early morning after the official meeting, so we should be able to hold it on time. Phew, all right. Administration minister, prepare the ceremony with the astronomy minister. Seleucin hid his smile and left. Four hours earlier. At the time the calendar priests and astronomy officials had decided on. When Shun asked, Seleucin nodded. Shun assumed Kyle had his reasons and prepared the solar eclipse ceremony to be held four hours earlier than originally planned. In front of Orazin's palace, one hour before the solar eclipse ceremony. Instruments were being played, and Shun and the night sky priests began to pray by reciting the usual prayers. Seleucin stood with the other ministers. As soon as the solar eclipse occurred, the king would step up to the podium, and Seleucin was facing the podium straight ahead. You have used your head quite a bit, but I have one. It was a boring event, but Seleucin had to hold in his smile. Kyle was a prince known for his intelligence and shrewdness, but he was still only fifteen years old. It was difficult for him to break through the limitations of being a child. As with the former king, things will move on quite smoothly. And when the predicted time of the solar eclipse came, Kao went up to the podium. He scanned the ministers and everyone else in attendance from the podium. And finally, he looked at Seleucin. Seleucin met eyes with Kyle. You're quite good at controlling your expression, but what are you going to do about the anger that is to come? Seleucin turned away several times in order to hide the smiles in his eyes. Then suddenly, a strange thought came to mind. What? People looked at the sky and murmured. Seleucin also raised his head. There were clouds in the sky, but the sun was still clearly seen. The solar eclipse was not taking place. From the podium, Kyle walked back and forth with his hands behind him as if he was bored and eventually sighed. The solar eclipse is not happening. Is the priest in charge present? Shun approached the podium. Yes, your majesty. It seems that the prediction about the solar eclipse is incorrect, so find out what's gone wrong. We should stop this current ceremony. All right. At those words, the astronomy minister stepped forward and put his head to the floor. Your Majesty. Punish me. What happened? It seems that our astronomy department has miscalculated the time. How come? The astronomy minister slightly raised his head at Kyle's question. I, I don't know. Then I will tell you, 
Kyle said from the podium. Both the calendar priests and astronomy department officials were basing their calculations off of old arithmetics and astronomy books. I hadn't noticed it either, but a dwarf named Rumpf did and told me about it. I was embarrassed by this fact and did not inform the other ministers, but I didn't realize you'd all made the same mistake. The astronomy minister stammered, B, but your majesty. In the Thunder Dragon King's book, it is written that the sky does not change. The Thunder Dragon King, Lockrack. It was a name that inspired awe in people of black scale just by hearing it. But that wasn't the case for Kyle. You fool. Isn't that an old book? Why can't you admit that they could be wrong? It can't be helped that they had no books to read before. But we can read numerous books in addition to the legacies they have left. Have you read the calendar book written in the faraway Mangul? As time passes, the sky's movement also changes. Didn't I already give you a clue? At Kyle's words, the astronomy minister trembled, and Seleucin felt like he had been struck on the head. That damn dwarf. He had read foreign books, then the astronomy minister said, But your majesty. Our black scale is a large country, and Mangul is so small. Is it necessary to have that knowledge, no matter how large of a country black scale is, can you say that we have as much power as the whole continent? Do we have all the knowledge there is on the continent? Kyle turned around and continued to say, punish those who were involved in the miscalculation according to the national law. And the priest in charge of the solar eclipse ceremony, reorganize things so we can hold the ceremony by the time the upcoming solar eclipse happens. The solar eclipse took place four hours later. As Vaisen Lak Orazen climbed onto the ship, he saw Orazen's harbor from the deck. I'll be back, Kyle. Kyle knew well that Vaisen was someone who enjoyed adventures. And it was also true that they had to explore the land beyond the eastern mountain range. Besides, it's necessary that I leave the palace. Three years ago, after he decided to give the title of Crown Prince to Kyle, Basin had in mind the worst-case scenario. In comparison to that, this kind of adventure was very peaceful. To the point where I can leave Orazen behind with joy. It would be a lie if he said he didn't have feelings of sadness, but as soon as he got on deck of the merchant ship named the Humiliation of Pirates, he was filled with enthusiasm for an adventure. As the leader of the Eastern Mountain Range Expedition Team, Vaisen should have the authority to lead 150 soldiers, who were split into three military ships. But I'm not boarding those military ships. Vaisen was riding on the merchant ship, the Humiliation of Pirates. It was a ship in service to Black Scale and belonged to the Itamo family, which had a long history trading with the palace. Vaisen was on the merchant ship since the military ship was too crowded for a royal like him to be properly treated. That's what they told me at least, but I know my personal supervisor simply wants to make sure I don't use the troops as I wish. As of now, he didn't know who his supervisor was. However, Vaisen was able to obtain a list of everyone on board the humiliation of pirates in advance, and he could guess a few of the candidates. The first candidate is definitely, a woman with her red hair tied up walked towards Vaisen. Nice to meet you. I am the captain of the ship, Theon Itamo. Nice to meet you. I am Vaisen Lak Orazen. So you are an elf. Theon's ears twitched. It's the first time someone recognized that immediately. I've only met lizard men who can't tell the difference between elves, nixes, and halflings. Halflings. Even the tall ones only come up to my waist. Oh well. Some people even confuse dwarves with elves. Ichem. I hope you understand. There are even humans who look like dwarves and halflings. But wouldn't it be hard to mistake me for them? Vaisen nodded. Theon Itamo had long arms and legs even for an elf. Anyways, we'll keep seeing each other from now on, so I hope we get along, said Vaisen. Sounds good. But there's something I would like to tell you in advance. Go ahead. Theon cleared her throat and said, no matter how high your status is, you must obey me on my ship. 
if you're not going to follow this rule, you'll need to get off and look for another ship. Vason seemed to think for a moment and then nodded. As long as you don't give unreasonable orders, I should be able to accept such conditions. When Vason accepted the condition without any complaints, Theon's expression turned surprised for a moment. But she soon recovered and nodded with a calm look on her face. All right. Other than that, since you're the leader of this expedition and a guest on my ship, I'll be as considerate as I can, L.C., thank you. But just one thing, has my luggage not arrived yet? Oh, Y.E.S.A. will be bringing your luggage, so do not worry. Y.E.S.A., what a pretty name. Theon shrugged. Name. I never said it was a name. But that's how I call them, so I guess you can think of it as a name. Vason looked puzzled. Then Theon turned around. They're actually just coming from over there. Vason followed Theon's line of sight and saw a three-dot-meter-dot-tall ogre with a magnificent physique walking towards them. Did someone mention Huang Yi.sa? Chapter 86 Black Scales Secret Trade You Are Listening at Novel Full.audio Vason unconsciously reached for his sheath, but he decided against drawing his sword when he noticed that everyone else was casually bringing their luggage on deck. Theon Itamo said, it doesn't seem like your first time seeing an ogre. Why do you think so? Normally, when someone sees an ogre for the first time, they become so frightened that they can't even think about pulling out a sword. I grew up more roughly than one would assume. This is our ship's first officer. Vason stood up straight and said to Y.E.S.A., Nice to meet you, ogre. I am Vason Lak Orazen. Nice to meet you, lizard. Vason didn't expect the ogre to notice he was royal. Rather, he found it refreshing that the ogre classified him by his species. The ogres that Vason knew rarely did so. Y.E.S.A. said, I, I am the first officer. Do you not have a name? I did, have a name. But I, the first officer, didn't like it, so I abandoned it. Vason was about to ask if first officer would be their name then, but Theon gave him a look, so he didn't. It's my first time seeing an ogre riding a ship. I don't think it's common. Why, do you think so, lizard? You, you are riding a ship for the first time, aren't you? And, the first time seeing an ogre work on board a ship, right? Vason was thrown off by the unexpected logic, but he hadn't made the comment without thinking it through. The ship has a limited amount of food supplies. So wouldn't it be advantageous to have species that eat little? That's right. Small friend. There are several. But they all eat, as much as, first officer. Ships are made of wood. Wouldn't the ship be ruined? Ship, is strong. And first officer, walk carefully. Theon stepped in and said, it may not seem that way, but Y.E.S.A. is from Zarin of the northern coast. Ah. Vason nodded. Zarin was one of the major metropolises of Black Scale and also the primate city where the elves lived. However, Zarin was also known for something else. All ogres from Zarin had high intelligence. And of course, there had been records passed down about them. About 150 years ago, the ogres of the northern coast had a god, and the god had made the ogres smart. It would have been nice if they lived happily. Out of them all, the smartest ogre and also their king ruled over the goblins, elves, and centaurs in the area, thus posing a threat to Black Scale, but Great Lockrack defeated them and made them citizens of Black Scale. After that, the elves conquered the northern coast and defeated the remaining ogres, and as time passed, the descendants of the ogre vagrants became part of Black Scale. That was where the ogres of Zarin originated. It said that the ogres on the northern coast of the past were smarter, but their intelligence gradually dropped as their blood mixed with wild ogres from other parts of the continent. In other countries, ogres were seen as no different than monsters, and the armies would even hunt them down in areas where the ogres resided, claiming they were eliminating vermin. That wasn't the case in Black Scale. In Black Scale, ogres would be treated as people as long as they were dressed, 
and if they were from Zarin, they would be the preferable hires for employers. They did eat a lot of food, but they worked just as hard. However, Vaisen was surprised that this ogre was given a station as high as a first officer. Would we be able to use ogres as left ministers in black scale? Probably not. Ye.sa then said, and first officer, abandoned land. You abandoned your land. Why? Land, no longer makes first officer scared. Living things on land, aren't stronger than me. So first officer, ride ship to defeat C. Vaisen thought it was a relief that this ogre had never met Manon. I hope you defeat the sea one day. Ye.sa nodded with a serious expression and left the luggage they had been carrying with one hand before taking their leave. Vaisen hoped Ye.sa wasn't his supervisor. Kyle said he wanted to send me on my way without a supervisor, but he couldn't because of the minister's opposition. They secretly put a supervisor among the passengers on board. A secret supervisor. Perhaps supervisor was nothing but a title. Even though Vaisen had the authority to mobilize soldiers as the leader of the expedition team, he had to get through Alika Yul, who was the general on one of the military ships. Alika Yul was the descendant of the famous head general, Yur. But Alika wasn't like Yur. She was upright but indecisive, and she seemed to have gotten on board for a particular reason. Since no one can plot a rebellion alone. Above all, Vaisen had never thought about plotting treason. If he had even entertained the idea, he wouldn't have given up his seat as crown prince in the first place. He held no selfish desire for the throne since he trusted his younger brother, Kyle, and judged that Kyle would be a better king. The problem is that even if I insist so, they don't believe me. In the end, only someone of Lockrack's bloodline could become king. So there could still be people who doubted Vaisen or wanted to use him. Of course Kyle would have thought that it would be safer to put me in a closed-off space rather than a rigorous rural area. However, the supervisor would be speculating Vaisen's intention on their own, so a minor act could be interpreted as an act of rebellion. And if that's not it, they can make an excuse to kill me for whatever reason. Vaisen couldn't think of a reason for them to do so, but he thought it was a possibility. The solar eclipse ceremony was a good example. Even though the astronomy minister had really done wrong, who would have thought that Seleucin O, who had been the administration minister for a long time, would be discharged and exiled to a hamlet. That incident left a strong impression on many ministers, as well as the noblemen working under them. The ministers had mistaken Kyle as soft-hearted even after he became king because he treated Vaisen, the former crown prince, with kindness, but they must be seeing Kyle in a different light now. Veiled enmity within the palace is not so simple. They might think killing me is a way to weaken Kyle's power. When he thought about it, it sounded quite plausible. Kyle trusted Vaisen, but nothing could be done if the supervisor killed Vaisen and told Kyle that Vaisen had tried to plot a rebellion. The dead had no chance to justify themselves. That might be the reason there weren't many issues in putting together the convoy in the first place. Vaisen wondered if he should get off the ship right now and tell Kyle his theory, but he thought that Kyle was likely to have thought about all that since he was the one proposing the idea. Theon then said, By the way, Prince Vaisen. Just call me Vaisen. It's a bit odd to call someone so noble that way, or call me team leader. That sounds good. Team leader, do you know what our next destination is? Vaisen looked back at Theon. As far as Vaisen knew, there were a few hamlets that were used as harbors when going south from Orizen. There was a lizardmen village as well, and even a clan village. They weren't as big as a primate city where certain species lived though. Vaisen didn't know their names. He barely knew anything about sailing. I don't know exactly. Don't we just need to sail south past Maganen at the southern end? And then we'll move east from Maganen and go straight up along the coastline. That would be our overall route, but our next destination is Bavrin. Bavrin. Vaisen knew of Bavrin. Outside of Orizen, it was the biggest harbor city in the area, but that wasn't the reason why Vaisen knew the name of the city. 
Isn't that abroad? Yes. It's Danium's harbor city. But shouldn't we be going west rather than south or east then? It wasn't a city too far away. However, given Danium was close to the center of the continent, its coastline was west of Orizen. But we're a merchant ship, right? Hmm. I'll let you know the specifics once we leave the harbor. First, I'll tell you where you will be staying, so follow me. Oh, should I help you carry your luggage? No, why that essay should have taken them inside, no, it's okay. Vason lifted his luggage with both arms. The ogre had carried it with only one hand, but the luggage was heavy enough that a regular serviceman wouldn't be able to carry it alone. Theon looked at Vason, impressed. I'll lead the way. The voyage was smooth. When there wasn't much for Vason to do, he would go out onto the deck and watch the sailors work or look at the distant horizon. Theon was a seafarer, while Vason had never been on a ship in the sea. She was worried that he would become seasick. Contrary to her concern, though, Vason experienced no seasickness at all. By the way, Theon. Why is the ship named the Humiliation of Pirates? Oh, it's quite boring. You'd think it would have been better not to know once you hear the reason. Better boring than not being able to sleep out of curiosity. Ha <laughs> ha. It's not anything special. It's only because we took the ship from a pirate. Oh, really? Theon said, I think the pirate had also taken the ship from someone else, but the other merchants said that the shape of the ship was quite unfamiliar, and thus they thought it must be made somewhere far away. The technology itself isn't different from ours though. Interesting. Anyways, the ship was in good condition, but it was cheap because of the story, and I was able to buy it. Vason nodded. Oh, and you said you were a merchant. Yes. How did you end up doing this kind of work? Theon looked at Vason with a puzzled look on her face, as if she was wondering why he would ask such a thing. What? It makes money. Black scale is always generous. Especially when it comes to dealing with the palace. And the trade can be trusted. When working with black scale, most merchants ask for only small deposits in advance so that they will get greater payment after the work is done. They aren't worried about not getting paid. Vason took pride in the trust the merchants had in them. Theon continued to say, I received a good deposit this time. What did you receive? A glasswork from Black Scale. Does that make money? Vason asked because he was curious. The palace was full of objects made of glass, so he didn't think much of it. And when he was younger, he often broke them. The dismayed look on the left minister's faces didn't exactly leave him with many good memories. Are you kidding? Black Scale's glassworks are valued higher than those of Golden Eye or Stone Cave. Bavrin is just the middle distributor. The Satyrs sell the ones from Asbestos or Danley at such a high price. Merchant work seems hard. No, it's simple. Buy cheap and sell expensive. Black Scale's glassworks come from Black Scale, so they're cheaper than those in other countries. And because there aren't any glass craftsmen in Daim, Asbestos, or Danley, and the glassworks are prettier than the decorations made in Stone Cave or Golden Eye, they sell more expensively. Plus, glass breaks easily, and more are bought when they are used and broken. Hmm, anyways, we don't have many opportunities to trade for glass since we can only make such trades with black scale. Wealthy merchants take turns making deals, so we were able to take this opportunity and fill the ship with wares. Dot after seeing Theon's passion for glass, Vason decided not to tell her that he often broke them. Then Theon said, Anyway, some of the leftover money from the trades will be used to feed the oarsmen and the soldiers of the three military ships you see over there. They're military ships, so there isn't much space available, and we have to fill our ship with their food supplies and water. Of course, we're going to continue to trade until we get to Maganen. Oh, so are we going after buying something from Bavrin? Of course. How could we leave the ship empty? Vason wondered why that wouldn't be possible, but he decided to go with it since Theon, who was the captain of the ship, said so. 
that makes me wonder. Once you sell the glass craftwork, what will you fill the ship with? Oh, usually we buy expensive things of that area since the prices of goods vary from time to time. And depending on where you go, you could get more. I guess so. But we have made an agreement with the palace, so what the ship will be filled with has already been decided. And what is that? Uh, they told me to keep it a secret, but it should be fine if I'm telling the expedition team leader, not the prince. We're trading for Niter. We are going to buy it from Bavrin and sell them at Sashian. Vason didn't know what that was, so he asked, Niter. Apparently there's a lot in Mangul, but I don't know too much about it either. I heard they're good for farming. That it increases the fertility of soil. Really? Sashian is a lizardmen village, and they do have a large plain. Are they planning to make a big farm? Is it similar to the way Chosen Ones struck the ground with lightning at the beginning of the year? Thunder power. Wow, I saw it when I was young. It was amazing. However, Basin couldn't quite understand why they were secretly purchasing such a thing. Chapter 87 Two Ministers and One Teacup You are listening at NovelFull.audio After Seleucin O was exiled, many of the noblemen inside Orazin's palace started watching what they said. And the finance minister, Nergak, was one of them. In his opinion, Seleucin had been demonstrating great worldly wisdom. Seleucin had been confident and competent. He hadn't been defeated simply because he lacked astronomical knowledge. It's true that not only the noblemen, but also that the ministers are getting dull because they underestimated foreign studies. Kyle Lak Orazen had known since long ago that the scholars who went in and out of the palace had been neglecting foreign studies. And perhaps he even knew that before he became king. However, he kept the fact to himself until the day the solar eclipse took place. That was likely done to defeat Seleucin. His majesty knew how Seleucin would act, so he had stayed silent until then. Kyle was a wise king who knew how to be patient until the right time came. And that was why the noblemen were afraid. Especially Nargak. He had been staying quiet after Kyle demonstrated his abilities, but the problem lay in what he had said before that. Shit. Before Kyle became king, or to be more exact, when Vaisen was still crown prince, the ministers had been divided in two groups. Those on Vaisen's side, and those on Kyle's side. There had been a fight over which of the two princes would become king. Of course the fight fizzled out when Vaisen showed that he had no will to be crown prince, and the king of serenity had also come to lean towards Kyle, but putting himself in the shoes of someone who had waited several years to defeat Seleucin, he would definitely remember what had happened years ago. At that time, Nargak was stubbornly on Vaisen's side. It wasn't because he didn't like Kyle personally. Nargak tended to be very conservative, so unless there were particular flaws, he believed it would be reasonable for the first prince to be crown prince. If that wasn't the case, he thought that the second or third prince, or another royal family member would stir up trouble in the palace, saying they could also be king. It was Nargak's belief that rules should be adhered to. However, rules sometimes applied differently, and Kyle eventually became king. How would I have known this was going to happen at that time? Seleucin was just the beginning. Recently, several ministers had been punished after facing Kyle and revealing their dirty linen. And Seleucin's case could have been considered rather tame. Those who used their status as ministers to get their hands on the national treasury or to bully the people were sometimes executed. But it never got to a point where it would be called a purge. Kyle not only knew about the crimes of the government officials, but he also had collected undeniable evidence. In many cases, punishments were given before the other ministers could even say something. And the quiet wind was now coming Nargak's way. Elder Nargak. Oh, it's you, Chung. What is it? It was you, Chung, the halfling who worked as a left minister. He was Kyle's age and had been Kyle's playmate within the palace. Therefore, while he didn't have a high status, he was one of the left ministers that Kyle favored, and thus one of the left ministers that the other ministers feared. 
You, Chung said, His Majesty wishes to see you. Nargak gulped. The time has come. Nargak visited Kyle in the early evening. Nargak, the finance minister, has arrived, Your Majesty. Sit down. Even though the floor was warm due to Andal, it felt cold to Nargak. Have you eaten? Pardon. Oh, no. I haven't gotten to yet. Then have some refreshments. As soon as Kyle finished speaking, Yu, Chung came in and served refreshments. Kyle pointed to the sugar snack and said, Isn't the shape pretty? Yes. It looks like it was carved by a craftsman. It's a present sent from automation. I heard it's a snack made of sugar all the way from Golden Eye. It is actually treated as a craftsman's work, but when the weather is hot, it melts and becomes a lump of sugar. That's not bad either. Still, it would be better if the shape is pretty too, right? Of course. Hurry and eat. Reminded of his grandchild because of Kyle's childlike attitude, Nargak smiled, but he soon came to his senses. No. The person in front of me is not a child, but the king. Then Nargak said, Your Majesty, for what reason do you want to see me? Kyle put his lips to the cup of tea and said, Oh, come to think of it, finance minister. Yes. I happened to come across your past activities, Nargak's heart sank. He couldn't think of anything he had done wrong. Nargak was a sincere and responsible official. And in particular, since the finance minister managed the national treasury, the late king of serenity had put him on that seat for his sense of duty. However, it's that much easier to find flaws. Finance minister was a dangerous position. Even if Kyle didn't do much, the other ministers could set up a trap for him. And even if it wasn't something related to his work, the fact that he used to stubbornly support Vason could come back to haunt him. Nargak put all his attention on Kyle's following words. Kyle said, I heard you're from Yen Pai, is that right? Oh, yes. How does your majesty know such a rural village, I looked into it because there were ministers who didn't have any surnames. Yes. Unfortunately, my family was poor, so we have no well.known ancestors. Nargak bowed slightly as he spoke. A name without a surname meant that they were a person of low status. Humph, are you embarrassed because you don't have a surname? To be honest, yes. Why? I can't help but be embarrassed since my ancestors did not contribute anything when Black Scale was established. Kyle waved his hand. But while the aristocrats are borrowing the reputations of their mothers and fathers, you have risen to your position on your own, haven't you? Doesn't that prove your competency? Nargak became emotional. Despite the nagging sense of inferiority stemming from his lowly background, he took pride in the fact that he had competed with other aristocratic officials on his own merits and become a qualified official in his own right. However, he couldn't reveal that pride in the palace. Almost all the other right ministers in the palace were aristocrats. In order to enter their world, he had no choice but to act and think like them, so Nargak always had to keep up with them. But today, the king had acknowledged his competency. Nargak said in a choked up voice, If that's what you think, then I can only shed tears of gratitude, your majesty. Kyle nodded. So I was hoping that you would get along with the hunting minister. Pardon. Isn't the hunting minister not from aristocracy either? There are times when you two have productive debates, but I would sometimes be worried because you would both let your emotions get the best of you. Nargak being on edge with the hunting minster, Dayanin, also stemmed from his inferiority complex. Dayanin had the tendency to look down on those who were aristocrats, so Nargak would join the aristocrats to attack Dayanin. But that was only until now. Nargak said with all his heart, yes, of course. I will do as you wish, your majesty. Kyle smiled. That is all I wanted to say. Pardon. Nargak was surprised. Oh, actually, that wasn't it. Now that I think of it, I heard you saw your grandchild again, the conversation moved to Nargak's family. 
By this time, Nargak had lost all the tension he had been holding, so he was able to make jokes here and there, and when he was leaving Kyle's detached study, he even carried with him a bundle of sugar snacks that Kyle had ordered you. Chung to give him. Is His Majesty embracing the minister who had tried to prevent him from becoming king? Black Scale has really come to serve a precious king. This is all by the grace of night sky. Nargak returned home with anticipation. On the other hand, as soon as Nargak left, the sliding door to the left of Kyle's detached study opened. Kyle didn't even look at the opening door when he said, Do you think the finance minister is a dangerous person? Dot no. Then the conversation is done. You can also come and have a taste of this. The lizard man hesitated before getting up and taking a seat in front of Kyle. He had white scales and red eyes. It was Dayanin. The finance minister is a sincere person. I don't think there's a need to push him off the ledge just because he's not on good terms with you, you don't really think that way, do you, your majesty? In Dayanin's opinion, Nargak could become a dangerous minister. Having the potential to be dangerous also meant that he wasn't dangerous at the moment, of course. In fact, the dangerous ministers had already been dealt with one way or another, so it could be said that Kyle's position had become somewhat solidified. However, Dayanin believed that since the dangerous ministers had been dealt with, those who could be dangerous should also be dealt with. But it seemed that Kyle thought differently. I said this to the finance minister as well, but I hope you will get along with the finance minister, o.org, but, but. Kyle looked at Dayanin with half-dot-lidded eyes. Do you not realize that you've come to enjoy this sword dance? Dayanin froze. After he made up his mind to help Kyle become king, Dayanin had worked very hard. And his hard work continued after Kyle took the throne to stabilize Kyle's royal authority. Hunting minister was still seated at the end of the great hall, but no one could dismiss him as such. The number of people and resources he had received under the excuse of managing Manon were continuously used to discover the minister's dirty linen and weaknesses. And Dayanin believed it was all for the king, Kyle. But was it not all for myself? The things Kyle had said to Nargak were meant for Dayanin as well. Nargak's inferiority complex served as his stepping stone to join the aristocratic officials. On the other hand, Dayanin's inferiority complex was used as a basis to triumph over the aristocratic officials. Dayanin belatedly realized this. This talk was not only meant for Nargak, but also for me. Kyle was not simply a smart king. He had the wisdom of an old wise man, which was different from being precocious. Perhaps my loyalty has also been part of His Majesty's plan. Then I should use this sword as His Majesty wishes. Dayanin poured tea into the teacup used by Nargak and drank it. Your Majesty is right. I will get along with the finance minister. That's good. You will be busier going forward, so you can't just keep focusing on the fight inside the palace. I'll keep that in mind, Your Majesty. Kyle nodded and touched the teapot. The tea has cooled. Yes, since a long time has passed. You should have told me. You, Chung, the tea is cold. Then you, Chung immediately brought another teapot. The clattering sounds filled the moment of silence. And as you, Chung left, Kyle filled Dayanin's teacup and said, Anyhow, what happened to that alchemist with horns? Are you talking about we Ravina Mule? Kyle nodded. Dayanin warmed his lips with the tea and said, they would have arrived at the palace already. Chapter 88 Black Scales Alchemist You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. We, Mun, the head of the left ministers, was 65 years old, and she was also a living record of the royal family who had assisted the kings of the past three generations. Her hair had already turned completely white, and her influence made it so that the left ministers, the right ministers, and even the king couldn't treat her however they wished. She could be seen as the celebrity of the palace as all the left ministers of different species under her command, including the humans, elves, halflings, nixes, dwarves, kobolds, and frogmen would follow her in a heartbeat. 
Unlike what the rumors would suggest, however, Wee Kamun was looking somewhat anxious. The Wee family was one of the most well-known in black scale. What set the Wee family apart was the fact that all the other famous influential families in black scale were lizard men. A member of the Wee family would always assume the role of the Lord and Margrave of Automation, and the family also had the reputation of always being given the position of left ministers. They were noble and high dot ranking officials, but above all, the Wee family was a great merchant family. This was because the merchants entering Black Scale had to go through automation, and that was also true for the merchants leaving Black Scale for other countries. There was no aspect where the Wee family was lacking in, but their great fame didn't come without darkness. The Cursed Antlers Automation had gotten big in Wee Dot Kyung's time, which was about 150 years ago. Wee Kyung had a pair of deer antlers that grew on her head, which was now considered a historical myth much like the story of Lokrak killing the evil god. And there was also word that Wee Kyung and Siran Mule, the lizard man, had a child between them, and that the mixed blood had become part of the Wee family. But of course, a human and a lizard man could not have a child, and thus people interpreted the branching antler crest of the Wee family as a wide range of powers. However, the adults playing important roles in the Wee family knew that a part of the legend was true. In the Wee family, there had been children born with antlers just like Wee Kyung in the legend. Only the antlers were dealt with in accordance with the family rules because all children born with antlers would become crazy. There wasn't a single exception. Children born with antlers would talk to the air, or show talents that defied common sense. They would go through a battlefield of pouring arrows completely unscathed, or they would be perfectly fine after falling from tens of meters high. Those were surely powers that arose from ancient evil. The Wee family had decided to contain that power before the congregation of night sky became larger. And luckily, the method was simple. Within the Wee family, parents with children born with antlers had to periodically cut and grind the antlers. That way, the child would be able to grow into an adult normally. However, that method could not prevent others from being born with antlers. There had been debates within the family that perhaps those people should refrain from continuing their bloodline, but that idea was dismissed because it was too harsh. According to the legend, Wee Kyung was able to become a wealthy merchant with the mysterious power, but considering that her end was miserable, people were more inclined to think of it as a curse. There was also word that the wealth and glory Wee Kyung had accumulated all derived from ancient evil. And it was believed that the power led to the birth of a child between Wee Kyung and Siran Mule, the lizard man, that it made an impossible love possible. Due to the shameful matter leading to the existence of children with antlers, the elders of the Wee family considered it a sin they had to carry forever. The children born with antlers would have Mule added to their name. And the mule collateral line was treated the same as the Wee family, but they had to live somewhere deep in automation and not show themselves. It would have been good if the story ended like that, but, an outlier was always destined to be born. And we Ravina Mule was one such child. Ravina, who had run away from the castle when she was only nine years old, had gotten onto a merchant's freight wagon setting out for the continent and left. And her parting words were, I can't live in a place like this forever. Ravina abandoned both her surnames of We and Mule and aimlessly wandered the continent. She had followed a satyr merchant as their errand girl, had been captured by a band of bandits and sold as a slave, and had also studied under a knoll aristocrat in Danley. The We family made the judgment that they couldn't just let her be and hired people to chase after her. When the hired mercenaries caught up with Ravina, she was working at an alchemist tower located in asbestos as an assistant. The mercenaries informed the Wee family of her whereabouts, and the elders could not be more shocked. The Alchemist Tower Past the fortress walls that had been built crudely on the top of a mountain was a storage with all the rare medicines and treasures, a library with all the knowledge in the world, and a school where alchemists taught forbidden knowledge that outsiders were not even allowed to observe. If these alchemists were simple scholars, people wouldn't avoid them. However, they were all non-dot believers on top of that. Although gods didn't manifest before everyone, 
their miracles were undoubtedly real. And in particular, priests who borrowed the powers of gods were living proof of their existence. Moreover, there had been stories passing down from generation to generation about the guardians of gods appearing at critical points of battles when the fate of the countries depended on it, while it was a debate whether the stories were true, many believed them. However, alchemists denied the obvious existence of gods and prioritized their knowledge. In the eyes of those who believed in gods, they were irreverent individuals who likely had something to do with the ancient evil. The current lord of automation, we do, young, said that we, Kyung going to the alchemist tower was perhaps a natural end. There had been many cursed individuals like we Ravina Mule at the alchemist tower. And the elders of the we family, including we do, young, decided not to chase after Ravina anymore. The alchemist tower was one of the few places where the cursed antlers of the we family could be forgotten, and there was another realistic issue involved. The alchemist tower was able to remain there even when it was full of non-believers because they had enough power to not be conquered. Even the nearest trolls of asbestos had made a few attempts, but the alchemists defeated the soldiers by shooting flames with their mysterious power or using a horrible poison that would melt people. Asbestos did have the strength to defeat them, but considering the amount of soldiers that would be lost in the process, they judged that it would be better to leave them be and collect tributes instead. All stories about the Alchemist Tower and We Ravina Mule seemed to be getting forgotten as a part of history. Until His Majesty asked for Ravina. We Mun looked at the woman with antlers in front of her. We Ravina Mule seemed like an ordinary woman in her mid-twenties. She had black hair, deep maroon eyes, and skin darker than those of elves, which showed that she was originally from automation. She also bore a resemblance to Wee Mun when she was younger as they were from the same family. Except for those antlers. Wee Mun was born and raised in automation, and she had seen Ravina's mother, the one with cursed antlers, but because she had always cut them, it was the first time Wee Mun saw fully grown antlers. Ravina asked, Are they amusing? We, Mun sighed. I'm sorry. There are so many mysterious things in Orizen. I wasn't looking at them because I found them amusing. That's okay, Elder. It's common for people to stare at my antlers when they meet me for the first time. I mean, you can't help but look at them when they're this big. They catch attention. The pair of huge deer antlers were divided into several branches. We Mun tried her best to ignore Ravina's antlers and said, To be honest, I didn't know you would come as soon as I contacted you. I'm asking just in case there's a misunderstanding, but you know why I called you, right? Yes, Ravina replied. It was a months long journey from the Alchemist Tower, located at the edge of Asbestos, to Orizen, so one wouldn't make the journey unless there was a special occasion. Ravina then said, I heard that His Majesty is looking for an alchemist. That's right. We, Mun nodded. Kyle Lak Orazen, the king of Black Scale, wanted to find an alchemist. But unlike Asbestos, Black Scale was harsher to non-believers like alchemists. All knowledge related to alchemy or ancient evil would be confiscated by the palace, and those with the knowledge would be punished. Therefore, the king had to turn to foreign countries to find an alchemist. However, alchemists also lived in hiding in foreign countries, and the most well-known home base of alchemists, namely the Alchemist Tower, banned outsiders from coming and going as they pleased. We, Mun was puzzled by the fact that Kyle was looking for an alchemist, but fortunately, the only alchemist she knew was hiding in the Alchemist Tower, where normal people could not enter or leave from. She had thus thought that Kyle, the king, wouldn't learn of Ravina's existence, but someone from the Wee family must have leaked information to him. And soon, Kyle learned of the cursed antlers and of Ravina's existence, and an order was given to the head of the Wee family in Lord of Automation, We Do, Young, to call Ravina to the palace. We Do, Young, We, Mun, and the rest of the Wee family hoped for Ravina to ignore the order, but surprisingly, Ravina traveled the long distance and arrived at Orazan's palace today. While Ravina was part of the Wee family, she and Wee Mun were no different than strangers who just met today. 
Ravina was rather a person that we, Mun, should be wary of since we, Mun, was responsible for palace affairs and assisting the king. And above all, Ravina's intentions were not yet known. I can't let her face his majesty this way. Ravina coveted forbidden knowledge and was a non-believer, and she could be punished by national law. If Ravina showed any signs of irreverence, we Mun planned to summon the palace guards right away. Dot, I'll stop beating around the bush and cut to the chase. Why have you come? Because of His Majesty's order. You abandoned your family, wandered around for more than a decade, and are associated with the alchemist tower that no one could go into or out of unless they belong there. And you're an alchemist who doesn't serve any god. What are you afraid of that you would obey His Majesty's will? Ravina met Mun's eyes with a look of surprise. Pardon. His Majesty is a fearsome person. That's right. But how would you, who lives far away in the land of asbestos, know that? You didn't think His Majesty would lead an army to find you if you hadn't come, did you? Ravina blinked with embarrassment. His Majesty probably would have done that. What? Even if the method is different, he would have tried to enter the Alchemist Tower in any way possible. I came because I was afraid of that happening. What do you know about His Majesty that you would say such a thing? In response to that question, Ravina said something irrelevant, I see you aren't familiar with the forbidden knowledge. Ha, huh, of course. How can anyone covet such knowledge when they know the glory of their family and know to fulfill their duties to black scale? And what does that have to do with His Majesty? His Majesty might be disappointed to hear that. What are you saying? Ravina reached into the bag next to her. We, Mun flinched and kept a wary eye on Ravina, wondering if she was going to take out an alchemist tool, but what Ravina pulled out was a letter. The same letter has been sent to the alchemist tower since a few years ago. It is filled with questions about ancient forbidden knowledge. The letters always came from different locations, so the alchemists of the tower had thought that it was another alchemist outside of the tower who wanted to hide their identity. So. However, this letter then came, and only then did the alchemists find out where they were from. Orizen. There is only one person capable of doing such a thing while knowing the most about the forbidden knowledge of Orizen. We, Mun immediately got up and said, you dare not. Don't say anything you can't be responsible for. No. I must say it. You. His Majesty is already the best alchemist with no rival in black scale. We, Mun yelled, is anyone out there? Call the palace guards. At that moment, the door opened, and a lizard man came in. Even from a human's perspective, the lizard man was short and thin, which made it clear that he wasn't an adult yet. We, Mun, that's enough. It was Kyle. Chapter 89 Falling Tower You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Your Majesty. We, Mun froze and couldn't move. Following Kyle, Dayanin came in and closed the door. Dayanin said, His Majesty had been anticipating we Ravina Mule's arrival but couldn't wait to see her, so he came himself. Kyle nodded and sat next to Ravina. Then he said to we, Mun, I'll explain everything, so why don't you sit back down first? Your Majesty, is everything the alchemist said true? True or not, I don't think it's something a left minister like you should concern yourself with. Keeping your Majesty safe is a left minister's duty. I don't think reading a few more books would cause any problems for my safety. However, just sit down for now. Dayanin, you don't need to stand around either. Take a seat. All right. We, Mun could not be worried about Kyle. Every country grew through blessings and miracles from the gods they believed in, and the priests were still offering their help. That was why non-believers were not welcomed. In black scale, they were merely banned and punished by national law, but in places like Dan Yum, it was common for non-believers to be beaten to death by a whole group of people. His Majesty cannot be punished no matter how strict the law is. However, it will inevitably become the minister's weapon to attack him. 
many of the ministers have come to support His Majesty, but a few have not. We, Mun realized early on that Kyle was not only exceptionally intelligent, but also wise. Therefore, she agreed when the hunting minister, Dainan, said that Kyle needed to be made king. To that end, she shared her opinion with the late king of Serenity. But I can't believe His Majesty is interested in wicked studies like alchemy. It must be the doing of that white lizard. We, Mun glared at Dainan, but Dainan avoided eye contact. Kyle then said to Ravina, you must be the alchemist. Yes, your majesty. Kyle nodded and looked at Wee. Mun. Wee, Mun, I'm sorry I've kept it a secret from you. However, I assumed you would be too worried to fall asleep at night even if I explained my situation because you're somewhat a straight arrow. That was why I didn't tell you. Your majesty, thank you for your concern, but alchemy. What would the ancestors think? Kyle shrugged. I don't know. There was no such study as alchemy in the past, so that's something we can never be certain of. Alchemists claim that they are going to make gold out of nothing and pills of immortality. Do you not get the absurdity of that? I'm not too sure about the part about making gold and pills of immortality, but a lot of their knowledge is quite useful. However, studying alchemy in itself goes against national law. There would be no one to punish your majesty, but the ministers would be uncomfortable. Is that knowledge worth the risks? Kyle, who had been graciously replying to Wee Mun, shut her down with a short answer. Yes, it is worth it. Then Ravina added, Elder, I think I may be able to explain. Wee Mun silently looked at Ravina. So Ravina explained, Forbidden knowledge doesn't only come from studies done at the tower. If an alchemist on the outside comes up with something, items would be sent from the tower to gain their favor so that the tower can acquire the knowledge. Among them, there was an alchemist who lived alone in the northern part of Red Fruit, deep in the mountains. So what? But one day, updates stopped coming from the alchemist in Red Fruit. The tower thought that the alchemist perhaps needed help and sent someone to check if there was something wrong. When the errand boy got to the alchemist's house, they found no apparent problem from the outside. The house itself was hidden, so no one had visited them. Then what was the trouble? The errand boy was able to break through the locked door and enter the house. Only then did the errand boy smell a stench. The alchemist was dead. We, Mun frowned and said, are you saying that since no one had visited them, they died on their own? Yes. Because of forbidden knowledge. Yes. Ha, huh, I've heard something like that too. It said that there was an ancient evil who granted power in exchange for souls. Is that not the case for the alchemist? Before we, Mun could cast blame on the alchemist again, Ravina said, no, that's not what went down. The alchemist was discovered in their lab, but they hadn't sold their soul or anything like that. It was an accident. The alchemist had been mixing various substances to make gold, but heat was produced when certain substances were mixed, and an explosion occurred. In fact, those kinds of accidents occasionally happen at the tower too, so it wasn't particularly strange. We, Mun was relieved that they hadn't sold their soul, but she found it troubling that such an occurrence had been happening every now and then. The alchemist of red fruit died. Is there anything to this story? If it were an ordinary story, no, there wouldn't be. However, it's different when an alchemist is involved. Kyle nodded in understanding, while we, Mun was confused. Then Ravina said, the alchemist died, but before their death, they had precisely recorded how much of each substance they had added in that experiment. In fact, they had made the record extra precise since other alchemists had died in accidents while experimenting. What use would the record of a failure have? Elder, strictly speaking, there is no such thing as failure for alchemists. Alchemists were able to discover how to shoot fire or make water that melts skin through the failures you mentioned. And gunpowder, the discovery the alchemist of red fruit had made, was greater than any other discovery made by other alchemists to this day. The danger of killing people is a great discovery. Yes. We. 
Mun belatedly realized what Ravina meant. If they were an alchemist who was meticulous enough to write everything they were going to do, they would have been careful no matter what kind of experiment they were conducting. That means, Ravina grabbed her pinky and said, the gunpowder tested by the alchemist of red fruit was only this much. However, when a flame touched the gunpowder and triggered an explosion, the small soldered case containing the gunpowder was torn, and the shards shot out and stabbed the alchemist in the neck. We, Mun looked at Kyle. Is it a weapon? Kyle nodded and said, it is a weapon. We, Mun pictured it in her mind. She didn't know much about alchemy, but Ravina had said that the powder could be made easily, and that a small amount would be enough to kill someone. She wasn't sure what kind of weapon that would be, but it seemed self-evident that it was dangerous since Ravina and Kyle were both paying attention to it. As expected, alchemy is forbidden knowledge. Weak Mun was worried that Kyle would be fascinated by that danger. Your Majesty, even though Black Scale's land is small, it holds the highest status among all countries. No one can deny our superiority, so why must you take such a risk? We, Mun, yes. Kyle lowered his eyes and said, Unfortunately, this knowledge is not much of a secret. I wasn't the first to notice it, and Black Scale wasn't the first to bring an alchemist to the palace. The alchemists at the Alchemist Tower are cursed people who had fled from various places. Some of them still hold their home countries dear in their hearts. What do you think would happen when those countries ask them to return with that knowledge? Ravina added, and the other countries were trying to stop that from happening. I almost died around ten times on my journey here. Dayanin then said, they are mercenaries hired by other countries, or local soldiers disguised as bandits. We, Mun asked Dayanin, then. Yes. Soldiers who got secret orders from His Majesty had to escort Ravina from the Alchemist Tower to Orizen. The Alchemist Tower suffered unprecedented damage because of this knowledge, and they will have been completely conquered by the trolls of Asbestos by now. Kyle raised his head. We, Mun, you believe this period to be peaceful, but it's not anymore. Black Scale spies hidden in each country are delivering urgent news. The substances used in making gunpowder are experiencing dramatic price increases, and countries are all setting up secret bases to make gunpowder. Ravina said, gunpowder is certainly alchemy, but it is a piece of ancient knowledge at the same time. Something similar to gunpowder has been found in an ancient ruin, and it's said that an ancient weapon like it has been discovered. We, Mun asked in a trembling voice, Your Majesty, are you saying that a war will break out? Just because we have weapons, it's possible there might be a war. Then Kyle added, but what if our weapon is exceptionally outstanding? What if a dunce who had never even held a bow before does their part in the battlefield, sinks ships, and breaks down the fortress walls? What if we have the weapon while the other country doesn't? You would think we would win the war. We, Mun contemplated and eventually nodded. I can't really acknowledge it from the bottom of my heart, but in my head, I can see that your majesty's will is in the right place. I have no reason to oppose it, so please let me know whenever you need any help. Kyle smiled. Now that you mention it, I do need your help, Weef Mun. What is it? There is the matter that you are worried about, and we need to proceed with this plan secretly considering the spies other countries have planted in black scale. We had been using funds from the hunting department until now, but now that we have your permission. You're going to use the privy purse. The country's taxes were managed by the finance department, but the king's personal assets were managed by the left ministers. As the conversation returned to the topic of work, we. Mun's eyes became full of life again. It is certainly your majesty's assets. As I understand, there must be reasonable grounds for its use. Do you have in mind how much you're going to use, and where and how to use it? For the first time since Kyle came into the room, he said in a trembling voice, hmm, well, that is, a system window popped up in front of Sung, Woon. Notice. The production conditions for the black powder have been fulfilled. Carbon. Charcoal production is possible. Sulfuric acid. 
sulfuric acid production is possible. Potassium nitrate. Production is possible, borrowing method, foreign country, stone cave, nose of a niter mine. Black powder knowledge. Exists within country, black scale, more than one person is in the know, read more, dot. Sung Woon let out a sigh. Done. Inventions and discoveries tended to be proportional to the size of population. In that sense, black scale, which pursued political stability and was superior to other countries in food production, was able to complete their innovations and fix the flaws because their population was sufficiently big. However, that wasn't the case for some discoveries. For example, mixing all kinds of substances to make something else was only done by those who were devoted to such work. The art of making elixirs, also known as alchemy. It couldn't be helped that the process of discovering these kinds of mysterious technology was very tricky in the lost world. The more faithful the citizens of a country were, the more they hated developing that kind of knowledge. First of all, the ancient evil that existed in the setting of the world made it so that this kind of research tended to be hated, and additionally, those who had power and knowledge desired to stand above the general citizens. Simply put, the more a society believed in their god, the more difficult it was to make discoveries in mysterious technology. On the contrary, if non-dot believers were allowed to grow in order to discover more mysterious technology, the player's control would weaken. No matter what build the player was going for, there were pros and cons. However, the players of the lost world tended to create a society of pious followers. Scientific knowledge was fair in that if one player developed a place for alchemists to gather, everyone would eventually benefit from all the knowledge that came from it. So the alchemist tower of asbestos is the result of NIMBY syndrome. Though of course, asbestos was able to discover gunpowder the quickest and make the most out of it since the tower was within its border. And it was inevitable for black scale, which was far away, to obtain it relatively later. If they were unlucky, the ones with the knowledge could die, which would make it impossible for black scale to obtain it. That was if Sung Woon hadn't sent we Ravina Mule to the alchemist tower, the child with antlers, who had a high survival rate due to her demonic magic of probability manipulation. As Sung Woon looked at the system message with satisfaction, Eldar said from next to him, by the way, did Kyle and Ravina talk about the gunpowder, but not that. Chapter 90 Yabun's Pirates You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Sung Woon immediately realized what Eldar meant by that knowledge. You're talking about magic, right? Yes. The knowledge alchemists held was known to outsiders as mysterious technology, namely the art of making elixir, also known as alchemy. The mysterious technology was science, and accordingly, Alchemists were scientists, and alchemy experiments were scientific experiments. There was a flaw in the equation in that the alchemy experiments weren't strictly consistent as science was, and there was some mysticism involved, but the alchemists' willingness to embrace failure as development was similar to scientists. However, there were secrets that alchemists thoroughly hid. Demonic magic. On this land, Cursed individuals continued to be born just like we Ravina Mule, a human with antlers on her head. According to the setting of the Lost World, the Cursed Ones were remnants of ancient evil power found in ancient ruins like PZZT, or they came from lasting bloodlines like we, Kyung and Ravina. Demonic magic could manifest as different powers with different properties, including electricity, flame, and gravity, and those who were empowered by spirits of demonic magic could use those kinds of abilities. However, such forms of demonic magic were merely supernatural powers that were a facet of something greater. According to the knowledge discovered in places like ancient ruins, these superpowers stem from something at a higher level, and that was magic. Magic itself can be used by only a few people. And it's separate from the changes in society driven by the development of technology like gunpowder. It made sense that Kyle believed bringing up magic would only make we Mun more puzzled. And there was another reason. Above all, a wizard hasn't appeared yet. In order to become a wizard, at least half of the ancient ruins on the continent had to be explored, and the resulting knowledge had to be gathered. 
In the lost world, the birth of a wizard was equivalent to what the Industrial Revolution was to scientific technology, and it would define the start of a different era. But this time, the birth of a wizard was delayed. Usually they would appear within the first hundred years since the game starts. But it's probably because all the players value conservative tactics that they're distancing themselves from demonic magic and magic. A wizard might have appeared already in another continent. It could be said that Sung, Woon was in an advantageous position because he had incorporated one of the demonic magics into his religious system. And in order to learn magic, a player needed at least one kind of demonic magic. Then Eldar said, would wisdom have an advantage? Why? Because Asbestos has the alchemist tower. HM, it is most likely for a wizard to appear there. Isn't that something to worry about? Sung, Woon played innocent. I don't know. Wisdom is probably hoping that a wizard doesn't emerge from his land. The humiliation of pirates smoothly cruised and arrived at Bavrin. On board were the leader of the Eastern Mountain Expedition team, Vaisen Lak Orazen, and the ship captain in charge of transportation, Theo Nidimo. Although satyrs were the main occupants of Dan Yum, the harbor city, Bavrin, saw various species coming and going. Size-wise, Bavrin was smaller than Orazen, but it was comparable to Orazen since it was a harbor with lots of merchant ships. On the deck, Vaisen said to Theon, there are so many ships. Because it's the closest harbor to Orazen. Ships setting out from this harbor continue west to Stone Cave or Danley. And there are also ships that go beyond that. Where to? Theon looked back at Vaisen as if she didn't understand why he would ask that. To the western continent. Where else would it be? Rumors had it that the legendary storyteller Owen had eventually gone to the western continent. Does it really exist? There aren't any waterways for ships to regularly travel along, and many ships did fail to return after setting out for the journey, but it definitely does exist. No, what I mean is that it may just be a big island, right? Vaisen's question stemmed from the self-dot-centered worldview of someone who could have become the supreme ruler of the country at one point. And Theon believed the confidence wasn't unfounded. Perhaps that might be true. But those in the western continent seem to call us the eastern continent. Then what do they call themselves? The central continent. Why? They said there is another continent to their west. But I can't be certain about that part. L.C. Vason stroked his chin and said, Why don't merchants travel to other continents and trade? Even if it's dangerous, merchants would go if they can expect to profit from the trip. We only do that when the risk is somewhat acceptable. Is it that dangerous? You wouldn't know because you haven't been on ships a lot. There are pirates, reefs, areas where the wind doesn't blow, high waves, sea monsters, storms, all right. I get the idea. Theon smiled and said, I need to go make the trade. I'll be back. You can relax on the ship, or go have some fun at the harbor as long as you come back by the time we agreed on. I feel under the weather because the ship is small. I'll go on a walk. Vaisen took a tour around the harbor with his entourage and browsed the unique wares. Half of them were interesting, but the other half were from black scale, which he found no amusement out of. When Vaisen thought about it, he realized that it was only natural since the really interesting objects would be transported across the sea to Orazen rather than being kept in Bavrin. Anyways, I haven't noticed any sign. There were other people who assisted the expedition team on the humiliation of pirates. Vaisen thought there was the possibility that his supervisor could be among them, but no one was shadowing him during this little impromptu tour. I guess they wouldn't make it so obvious. Or maybe they simply took orders from their superior and don't care as much. When Vaisen was about to return to the ship, he found a fruit store and stopped there. There were fruits that didn't grow in black scale, so he struck up a conversation with the fruit vendor. Are you going back to black scale? The fruit vendor asked. Yes. Then you should pray to God that you won't run into pirates. Pirates. 
The gnome fruit vendor looked around as if it would be troublesome if anyone else overheard before whispering into Vason's ear, you don't know about Yabun's pirates. Dot no, I don't. Right, you said you were from Orizen. There's a group of pirates who dominate the whole area around Bavrin. And they mostly target ships setting out from Bavrin. Dan Young just lets them be. Of course not. However, the problem is that they are a large group of pirates from the south with more than one or two ships. It's said that they are continuing north from Bavrin, so wouldn't it soon become dangerous for the sea near Black Scale as well? Vason thought that this would be a serious problem if true. The soldiers of Danyum aren't that weak, so there must be a problem preventing them from stopping the pirates from approaching the city. And this is a large port rather than a small, nameless village. Vason was considering sending a letter to Kyle when Theon returned with the niter she had bought to later resell at Sashian. Kyle was likely to be aware of the matter already, but even Vason knew that something was worth noting when it happened repeatedly. He made sure to inform Theon, the captain of the ship he was riding. Yabun's pirates. Have you heard of them? Not at all. Theon laughed. All the harbor merchants do that. They make up stories or exaggerate them. That keeps up the appearance of some customers staying at their shop for a long time. It's a business strategy. I know that since Orizen, where I grew up, was also a harbor city. But you never left the palace, did you? Vason contemplated whether he should tell her that he spent more time hanging out with hooligans outside the palace, or if he should just stay quiet to protect his reputation. And it seemed that Theon took Vason's silence as admission. Oh, now that I think of it, the palace asked us to bring as great a load as possible, but apparently the goods I wanted won't arrive until tomorrow. So are you going to wait until then? No. We'll leave first and have the military ship carry the rest of the goods. But then we won't be escorted by the military ship. We have more goods to unload, and we'll buy food at Sashian. If we leave one day earlier, we'll save time. However, any time spent on the ship costs money, which includes drinking water, food, and the crew's wages. Vason couldn't say anything to that since Theon Itamo was the one in charge of all matters related to the ship. Then we must pray that we don't run into any pirates. Don't worry. I did talk about pirates too, but I've never run into them in my entire career. The next day, while looking at the horizon off the coast of Bavrin, Theon screamed, P, pirates. Standing by her side, Vason crossed his arms and sighed. It was clear that Theon was bewildered, but she quickly gave orders to throw off board the sandbags as well as drinking water and food supplies that weren't immediately needed to lighten the ship. And her last order was for the crew members to arm themselves with the shabby armory that each sailor had prepared on their own. There were three ships that appeared to be pirate ships. Vason couldn't be certain if they were pirates or not, but Theon came to the conclusion based on the ship's size and shape and the fact that they were obviously chasing the humiliation of pirates. And it seemed that the other sailors agreed too. Can we run away? The humiliation of pirates used to be a pirate ship. It is made of relatively light wood and comes with a large sail. It rides the wind well, but that isn't enough. All other conditions being equal, what would make the difference was the fact that the pirate ships would be loaded with only the necessary food supplies. What about the niter? The purpose of this journey is to transport niter, isn't it? It would be better to jump off the ship than casting it away. Still, Theon said with a straight face, pirate ships undergo modifications to remove all unnecessary structures as long as they can float in the water. They'll catch up to us anyway. We're throwing things away to buy us some time until the military ships arrive. They said they would load the wares once morning comes, so we should be only half a day apart if we're lucky. If only the wind would blow a little stronger, Theon put her hands together and prayed with her eyes closed while Vason stared at her. Then she cracked open an eye to glare at him. What are you doing? Hurry up and pray. Vason sighed and sloppily copied Theon's posture. Unfortunately, 
night sky wasn't able to fulfill their prayers because Sung, Woon didn't have small area. Sea breeze. And soon enough, the smallest and quickest pirate ship came up to the humiliation of pirates. Vason could hear the pirates shouting. Brother. Look at that. The ship can't go forward because it's loaded. Ha ha ha. You guys. It seems we'll be drinking until we're tipsy tonight. It was worth praying to the white spider god. Why don't we jump onto it before the others come? HM, wait. Not yet, once the pirates got close enough for Vason and the others to hear them talk, arrows flew from both ships. However, the deck of the humiliation of pirates was too high for the pirates, so they weren't able to shoot properly. On the other hand, the archers on board the humiliation of pirates were terrible at their jobs despite having the advantage of higher ground. White Spider God I've heard a name like that somewhere before. Vason didn't dwell on it. While he was quite an embarrassment in studying with books, he was confident in studying with his body. He picked up the horn bow that was the pride of black scale and leaned over the deck. Swoosh. The arrow pierced through the wind and hit a pirate in the middle of their forehead. The noisy chatters from the pirates soon died down. However, Vason was never one to consider other people's circumstances. The next arrow he shot buried into the temple of another pirate when they were still reeling from the shock. Only then did the pirate start to shout in anger. Those with bows fired arrows at Vason, but Vason had already taken cover behind the mast. Then an Astacidia, who seemed to be the head of those pirates, shouted, put the ship right next to theirs. We're going on board now. Ropes were thrown and fastened around the railings of the humiliation of pirates. Then the other ends were tied. The ship tilted as the pirates began to climb. However, the sailors on the humiliation of pirates remained still. Not because they were afraid. Vason, who was about to take action, also stopped to watch everything unfold. Who shot brother? The pirates quickly climbed the ropes and came onto the deck. However, a large black shadow stood in front of them. It wasn't Vason. First officer, don't like pirates. Kook. Pirate, throw off ship. The ogre kicked through three pirates into the sea.